Seems to make sense then to focus on the basics. Go with what we know, Barry said after a few minutes. We don't know how the reaction takes place, but we do know that something has to be fueling it. So, what? We're back to high school chemistry and talking about endothermic and exothermic reactions? Barry sounded particularly glum. That's not the point, I said, straining to keep my frustration with his attitude at a minimum. I know it seems like it's too much starting over, but if we begin at the beginning, maybe we'll see some things in a new light. Barry smiled at my little pun regarding exothermic and the production of light. The fuel's the thing, I agree. Then let's figure out just exactly what kind of fuel we're dealing with. Barry walked over to the reactor. Was it out of phase with the other part of the system it wasn't functioning? He took the top off the reactor, removed the cap, and lifted out the tower. He held the triangular-shaped, copper-colored fuel piece in his hand and squinted at it. I still can't get over how small it is, I said, glad also that it had been determined early on that it emitted no dangerous radiation. It was clear that it was part of a nuclear reaction, but it wouldn't be until years later that scientists here would be able to conceive and create devices that produced what would be called low-energy nuclear reactions. That meant that you could produce a nuclear reaction without nuclear and radioactive materials. We weren't there yet in our understanding of the capability to produce these kinds of reactions then. Barry had taken the fuel disk and set it on a small piece of filter paper. With a very fine file, he scraped its surface, collecting a minute amount of the filings on the paper. He added them to a liquid solvent and prepared to inject them into a gas chromatograph where it would be vaporized and analyzed. I joined him at the machine and watched as he inserted the material into the sample port using a micro syringe to get it through a rubber septum and into the vacuum chamber. Helium, nitrogen is also often used, began to flow as the carrier gas. I checked the pressure regulator to be sure it was within parameters. It was, and that gas joined the vaporized material we had injected in passing through a glass column packed with silica coated with a liquid. Since the material we placed in the solvent was insoluble, in other words, it didn't dissolve into the liquid but was suspended within it, the whole process took a matter of seconds. We were using a thermal conductivity device, TCD, and helium provided a shorter analysis time due to its higher flow rates and low molecular weight. The detection system in the device converted the property changes of the substances heated and vaporized into electrical impulses that a computer could analyze. Basically, it took an analog reading of the reactions taking place within the glass column and converted that reading to a digital one. The digital was less susceptible to interference and has a better signal-to-noise ratio. When we looked at the display the device provided, the chromatogram itself, literally a graph of the results, we noticed that there were no spikes, which would have indicated the presence of various elements. The X, horizontal axis, reflected the amount of time, while the y-axis measured the abundance or absorbance of the chemicals present. For example, if you put a drop of water in the device, you'd find a spike indicating the presence of hydrogen and oxygen. What we saw was nothing at all, except at the very far right of the graph indicating that something was in there, but it wasn't composed of any other known component elements. The obvious conclusion was that the material we were working with was an element itself. It wasn't a combination of other chemical substances, but was one of the basic building blocks we call elements. Barry and I stood looking at one another, shocked to realize that the fuel wasn't a compound, that it wasn't composed of multiple elements, but was a single element itself. I didn't expect that, Barry said. I was pretty certain it had to be some kind of alloy. I thought that same thing. After all, we have a limited number of elements on Earth, and most everything else is composed of combinations or variations on those elements.
carbon is an element, but when those molecules get rearranged in a certain way, you end up with a diamond that bears almost no resemblance whatsoever to carbon. We figured this fuel had to be like that, something relatively common that was combined with other materials that, working together in some kind of known process, fission, oxidation, or whatever, produced that enormous energy. I also knew that terrestrial spacecraft used liquid oxygen and either liquid hydrogen or kerosene in their rockets as a propulsion system. Solid rocket fuel was made up of a combination of powdered aluminum and an oxidizer. Of course, we were dealing with an exotic fuel not of terrestrial origin, but the kinds of systems and processes we used on Earth were our only real frame of reference. We could try other kinds of spectrography, but I'm pretty sure, given what this reveals and what we know of its origins, that it isn't going to be made up of anything we typically find here, carbon, for example, or any of the metals. That's probably the case, but we can't rule anything out, Barry said, stating what I knew to be obvious. On the one hand, as a scientist, I wasn't supposed to jump to any conclusions, but this was a special case. And just because I made that statement hypothesizing the result, that didn't mean that I was not going to do the work needed to confirm what I suspected. The frustrating part of all of this chemical analysis was that we were both working outside our fields of expertise, physics. Eventually, we subjected the material to mass spectral interpretation using a process called electron ionization mass spectrometry. It produced the same result, that same spike off the scale, more or less confirming what we suspected about the fuel being an element. We also conducted something called a neutron activation analysis. Essentially, we bombarded the fuel element sample with neutrons. As a result of that bombarding, we produced a radioactive isotope. Since we know the radioactive emissions and radioactive decay paths for each element currently on the periodic table, the spectra of the emissions will reveal what elements make up the sample. In this case, there was only one element that made up the sample, but it wasn't one that we could identify. Every day that I was on site and Barry and I worked together, I could count on one thing. Dennis would show up and ask what we'd done that day what progress we had made. We had to resist the temptation to oversell him on anything we'd done. We knew that they wanted us to get this job done, and we felt the enormous pressure of those expectations. But, as I've pointed out, we knew about the potential threat these materials posed. I also knew from my work in the scientific community, and Edward Teller's rise and fall within that circle was a clear example of this, if you hype something too strongly that is based on your speculation and highly reasoned and formulated opinions, you run the risk of being too optimistic. You had to produce results, verifiable and measurable results, that could withstand intense scrutiny and analysis. We also knew that Dennis was a layman, essentially. He didn't understand science to any great degree so until we had something that we could demonstrate to him as an unequivocal explanation of at least some part of the process that we could demonstrate, we had to be cautious about what we told him. It was a delicate balancing act, trying to meet their expectations and ease their disappointment with our efforts. I was in a constant state of anxiety. Worrying about my job safety, my personal safety, and the progress of my security clearance all became like a second job I had undertaken. The problems we were faced with solving occupied me day and night. Though I wasn't working every day at S4 and wasn't physically on site there, my mind was definitely occupied by the work 24 hours a day and seven days a week. I was vaguely aware of Tracy and our life together. I wasn't checked out of the relationship completely, but I was preoccupied. She seemed to be in relatively good spirits. She was enjoying the flying lessons she was taking. The photo business had proven to be something she could handle with minimal stress, and even though it meant us being apart, I was looking forward to being hired full-time. I wanted to be engaged in meaningful work, and Tracy and I were both adaptable, and we'd find a way to accommodate the changes that loomed on the horizon for us.
Life is all about change and adaptation, after all. I trusted in both our abilities, and as frustrating as it was to work in that environment, the fact that I was working on such an exciting project with so many potential implications for me personally as well as for the world, from time to time pierced the protective cloud I'd inflated around me so that I could concentrate on the task at hand. I didn't spend any real time thinking about how my name might one day be associated with an incredible advance in our understanding of the nature of the universe, but I did wonder what kind of bonus might await those of us working on the forefront of an exciting scientific endeavor and what it might mean for our future. Chapter 5 In February, if the end of the previous year's rains are plentiful enough, the Nevada desert blooms with wildflowers. Various types of nightshades, geraniums and roses, miner's lettuce and others put on a brief show. In 1989, when I made my way out to Groom Lake and Area 51, I couldn't tell you whether or not a floral bloom or bust was taking place out there. From my seat aboard the aircraft, or in the bus that took us to the S-4 site, I had on figurative blinders, thinking only of the task at hand. My world was reduced to the colorless and sterile environment of the lab and its facilities. Funny that the word facilities is related to the word facile, which has as one of its definitions easily achieved, effortless. Another of its meanings is appearing neat and comprehensive only by ignoring the true complexities of an issue, superficial. There was little about the job that was easy and effortless, and we seemed to be expected to ignore the complexities of the bigger picture question of how the craft operated. We were to focus solely on the one piece of the puzzle we were assigned to, and even the environment in which we worked reflected that single-mindedness of purpose. I'd never worked some place that was so devoid of signs of human life. I never saw a house plant or flowers. I never saw a photo of a loved one, a favorite vacation spot, a beloved pet on anyone's desk. No one had inspirational posters hanging on the walls of their workspace. No cats dangling from a branch urging us to hang in there. Oddly, or maybe I should say ironically, there was a poster hanging in one of the rooms depicting a saucer-shaped UFO with the caption, They're here. We were so segregated from others that even when we were in one another's presence, we were not allowed to speak. If, for example, we needed to borrow the salt from another table, we had to ask one of the security team's members to retrieve it for us. I would have thought that Barry and I would develop some kind of us-against-them mentality as fellow prisoners serving time together, but we didn't. I knew nothing of his personal life, and he knew nothing of mine. I don't know if those who lived on site during the week were more social, but given how oppressive the environment was where I worked, I highly doubted if there was a more lenient and relaxed and collegial atmosphere elsewhere in that part of the desert. In the world of animals and flora and fauna, some species manage to survive and even thrive in relative isolation. I didn't count myself among them. I was not then, nor am I now, a highly social animal needing to experience the gregarious pleasures of others to be happy, but given all that was going on in that world, I was greatly uncomfortable most of the time I was in it. My irregular work hours also meant that I was sleeping irregularly, and that contributed to my sense that I was living in a kind of fog. I've always appreciated an intellectual challenge, and have always been able to dig into a deep reserve of energy to power my brain. When I was on site, I was fine and functioning well mentally. At home, that wasn't exactly the case. I was managing, but preoccupied, so when Tracy expressed some concern she had about seeing men parked in a car just a few hundred feet down the block from our house, I was a little confused at first. I don't know, I told her initially. People do all kinds of things. They don't look like they belong here, she said. What does that mean? My tone betrayed an annoyance greater than what I felt. I immediately picked up on it and apologized and rephrased the question. 
What have you noticed that leads you to believe that? This is Las Vegas. You don't wear a dress shirt and have your suit coat hanging in the rear window. And it's two guys. Always two guys. They just sit there, and they don't even seem to talk to one another or even look around. It's like they're at a drive-in movie or something. Tracy shrugged her shoulders. I'm not paranoid, but something is up with those two. It finally dawned on me. They're most likely watching us for the security clearance. Oh, Tracy said flatly. At the time, I didn't remark on how muted her response was, how a half-dozen states of mind or emotion could have circled around that tiny mass of sounds. It's all part of it, I said, needlessly, as it turned out, since Tracy had already left the room. I went into the kitchen and let the water run for a long time before filling a glass. When I put it to my lips, I realized that I had turned the handle to the right and not to the left. I drank the too warm water anyway, as if punishing myself for some indiscretion I wasn't even aware that I had committed. One night when I was on call, Dennis came into the lab. Barry and I had been working on an experiment to test how the location of the parts of the propulsion device affected its operation. We moved the emitter a few degrees from center, closer or farther to it. This, along with seeing how focused we get the gravity field to be, had been taking up much of our time. Gentlemen, Dennis said, I'd like to speak to you both. Barry and I eyed one another warily. It's about the fuel. We each sat on a stool, and Dennis produced from his pocket one of the fuel pieces. It seemed to be an exact duplicate of the one we had been using. Dennis went on to explain that manufacturing an additional fuel element was necessary. He wanted our assistance with the process. I knew better than to ask, but I was immediately wondering, why the two of us? Yes, the fuel element was an important component of the propulsion system, but we didn't have a clear sense of how it was made or what it was made of. Dennis mentioned that the metallurgy group had made some advances, and there was some certainty I was used to Dennis and his vague references and passive voice constructions that never clearly identified who did what or who directed or requested what of its component materials. He didn't tell us exactly what those components were, only that the fuel pieces needed to be machined. That's the kind of stuff that the guys at Los Alamos do a lot of the time, I said as much to myself as to Dennis. They do? I knew a number of guys in the machine shop, well, one of the machine shops, and they were helpful. I know that from conversations I had with them that they were working on a lot of cutting-edge materials, high-precision materials, incredibly small tolerances, weapon systems, I assumed, highly classified work. Dennis nodded. He produced another of the fuel triangles. He set it on top of the first one. Each was about the size of a half dollar and no more than a quarter inch thick. I'd handled one before, obviously, but seeing the two of them stacked like that made me understand something I hadn't before. Truth be told, I didn't give that much thought to how they were made. But at that moment, I got a better sense of how they were likely to have been machined. They weren't stamped or cut out of a single flat sheet of their material. Instead, it seemed to me, that a larger block of it would have to be shaped into a cone. From that cone, whatever cutting tool was needed could be guided to cut through that cone at various angles to produce the triangular-shaped pieces. For a few minutes, Dennis, Barry, and I discussed how we thought the objective might be met. I offered my cone-cutting theory, and Barry asserted that he was in complete agreement that my suggestion was the likeliest scenario. Los Alamos can do this, Dennis said while nodding. He pushed himself away from the lab's countertop and walked out of the room. He came back in a few minutes with what appeared to be a cylindrical ingot of the material. I had no idea where he got it from whether it was a part of one of the crafts or came from somewhere else, but he hefted it in his hand, according it no more regard than a deli counter clerk handling a bologna sausage. This will go on ahead of you, he said.
nodding in my direction. We'll get the schematics drawn up, and then you'll be off to Los Alamos. As far as they're concerned, this material is known as LA-1000. As far as they're concerned, and as you're concerned while with them, this is a new alloy used for armoring. Understood, I said, wondering how soon I would be going, and if this little field trip was a good sign or a bad sign for my still pending clearance. Could the whole thing be a setup to test me? Ultimately, I decided it didn't matter. I was told to go to Los Alamos, and that was what I was going to do. The next time I got the call from E.G. and G., I was told to report to McCarran, but that I'd be taking a commercial flight out of Las Vegas to Albuquerque. From there, I'd transferred to a different regional flight to the Los Alamos airport. I was only going to spend a few hours on site, delivering the instructions for the manufacture of the fuel disc and armor. The ingot was sent via courier to Los Alamos, while Dennis met me at the airport and gave me a sealed 9 by 12 inch envelope that I assumed contained what I needed to deliver to the machinists at the New Mexico laboratory. Based on my experience working at LANL, I figured the ingot got sent out on what we referred to as a dash flight. They took off daily from Mercury, Nevada, near the old AEC base camp at the nuclear test flight. Back in my days in New Mexico, we often received materials from Area 51. Looking at the airport in the city where I'd spent so much time felt both familiar and surreal simultaneously. I wasn't able to tell Tracy where I was going, only that I'd be gone for longer than I usually was. I had no idea how many hours that would be, but I told her not to worry. I don't worry, she had told me. I just don't understand, and I don't like that. I had no way to reply, and just as I had landed in Los Alamos with no sense of how I was going to get to the location on the site's thousands and thousands of acres, I had no way to reassure or make Tracy understand that if I could tell her what I was doing, I would. Trouble was, more often than not, I really didn't understand what I was doing. In my mind, that meant I wasn't withholding anything from her. I was the one from whom things were being withheld. I was being the good soldier, and had to trust that Dennis and those in charge had my best interests at heart. I knew that was never really going to be the case. I was simply a moving part in a large and complicated machine, easily replaceable in some ways, of high value in others. The answer to my wondering about how I was to proceed was answered by someone asking me a question. Are you Bob? I turned to face a young blond man in his mid-twenties, a wedge of hair angled across his forehead and over one bespectacled eye, like a curtain across a picture window. I nodded, and the young man said cheerily, Let's go. A few minutes later, we were in a white passenger van passing through a security checkpoint on the property of the LANL. I had never worked in that area before, and even the entrance was unfamiliar to me. My driver hadn't engaged me in any kind of conversation, and I wasn't feeling particularly chatty myself. I was very tired, and may even have dozed off for a second or two on the drive over, just as I had, though for much longer, while on the flight in. The van stopped in front of an administrative building, what looked like a typical office building. There, I gave my name to a man behind a reception desk and picked up my visitor badge. He made a quick call, and then a woman came into the waiting area, and without introducing herself, asked me for the envelope I'd been carrying. She left immediately, and I stood there wondering what I was supposed to do next. After a few moments of me standing there, the woman returned, without the folder, and said that I was to follow her. I went into an office and was introduced to the man who supervised this particular machine shop. We went over the specs and how we wanted the cylinder to be sliced into discs, then stack those discs, fuse them, then machine that into a cone, and then into the triangle-shaped bits we'd been using to help power the reactor. None of what I asked registered on the face of the man I was speaking with. He spent most of his time looking at the specifications sheet and the schematic. In some ways, I envied him. He looked at the task as a kind of simple mechanical engineering fabrication problem. 
I knew that people like him worked with plutonium as part of the nuclear weapons making, so given that none of what I was describing to him involved fissile materials, at least as far as I knew, this was, pardon the pun, a relatively run-of-the-mill operation for him and his people. Of course, we also need all of the material back, I said. There'd be a minute amount of residue or leavings produced in fabricating the fuel triangles, but we still needed even the tiniest fragment to be returned to us. Any idea what kind of phase changes or thermal expansion we might be dealing with? he asked, ignoring my statement entirely. I don't believe there will be an issue, but with the kind of tolerances we're talking about, I shrugged, but didn't go on. I was tempted to try to ingratiate myself to him and his people by letting him know that I understood about the work they did, how creating an alloy with plutonium and gallium and other things was part of what they were responsible for, materials that presumably were far more volatile than what had been shipped to them. Instead, I let him, the expert, work out for himself how they'd get the job done. I wasn't worried about that at all, and shortly before I left the office, the supervisor sat staring off into the upper corner of the room for a few seconds, and then a satisfied smile spread across her face. I think I've got a better idea of how to get this done. He reached into a drawer and pulled out a small notebook and began scratching out a few notes. I didn't want to disturb him, so I simply said, I'll let myself out. Receiving no response, I walked out of the office and back into the waiting room. In what seemed like no time, I was driving back home from McCarran. I arrived home in the late evening, just around dinner time, and noticed that the car that Tracy had talked about wasn't there. Tracy wasn't home either. She left no note, so I put a frozen meal in the microwave and sat there eating the overly crisp outside of a macaroni and cheese dish and its still only partly thawed innards. Fatigue overtook me while I sat in an easy chair, and before I knew it, sunlight on my face had awakened me. Stiff and sore from my cramped sleep, I stood in the hot shower, hoping to ease the tension from my muscles. As soon as I had toweled myself off, the phone rang, and less than twenty minutes later I was out the door and heading back to McCarran and on my way to S-4 a cup of coffee and a fast-food egg sandwich of some kind jousting in my belly as I followed Dennis into an unmarked office. "'Take a seat,' Dennis said. Tired, and tired of Dennis's no-nonsense approach to things, I sat down in the chair and made no effort to engage him in any conversation at all. "'A new directive has been issued,' Dennis rummaged through a desk drawer and withdrew some papers. I thought that he'd tell me about the new emphasis we were to take in our research. Instead, he pulled out a small caliber revolver, what looked to be a twenty-two cal Smith & Wesson, and placed it on the desk. You're to carry this at all times when you're off-site. Whether it was exhaustion and discomfort, or I'd bought into too much of the Iron Curtain propaganda that had permeated life in the U.S. for a while, I immediately thought of the four Russian scientists who had once been seen regularly around the facility. They hadn't been seen for a few weeks, and even Barry, loath as he was to engage in anything even approximating office gossip, had commented on their absence. I also speculated about what had transpired, and was now putting two and two together and coming up with twenty-two. I didn't respond to Dennis at first but smiled ruefully to myself, thinking that two plus two equals point forty four, the caliber of the long-barreled magnum I owned. I wasn't exactly a gun aficionado, but given how much I liked explosives, I enjoyed owning a weapon and appreciated what one could do for me. I also owned an Uzi submachine gun that I appreciated for its design. I didn't let Dennis know about the Uzi, but I told him that I didn't need or want the twenty-two he was about to issue to me. I admired both the weapons I owned, but also understood that, on a certain level, practicality, they were ridiculous to own. I had purchased a holster so that I could carry the forty-four on my person, 
and that meant that I would have to wear a long coat to cover it. Not ideal in the heat of Las Vegas, and only a little more so when I lived in New Mexico. At the mention of the Smith & Wesson Magnum, Dennis slipped a bit for the first time in the two months I'd known him. One eyebrow raised a fraction of an inch, but then quickly settled. "'Have I made your day?' I asked him, referencing Clint Eastwood's forty-four Magnum carrying character Harry Kane and the famous line from the film Dirty Harry. "'Funny,' Dennis said, showing no sign at all that he saw the humor in my remark. "'At least I won't have to fill out these forms. That makes my day.' I'd expected him to put up more of a fight with me on this point, but was glad that he hadn't. I was familiar with my forty-four and more comfortable with it. I wasn't comfortable with the idea that I needed to be comfortable with the weapon. I pushed as many of those thoughts outside my mind as I could. We're done, Dennis said. I went back to the lab. Barry looked up at me, but didn't ask a thing about my meeting with Dennis. There really is nothing unusual going on here, he said. He handed me a readout from the gas chromatograph. We decided to do an analysis of the copper-looking plates on the sides of the emitter. In appearance, they seemed to be the same material as the fuel triangles, but proved to be, based on this analysis, made of common elements. Not exotic at all, I said, handing the sheet back to Barry. Not the most typical of alloys, but... I let the sentence trail off. Barry nodded distractedly. Have you given any thought to what I suggested about building that measurement device? With the right instrument, we'd be able to produce more verifiable results. It makes sense. Time is the one concern I have. I agree, but with the kind of seat-of-the-pants tests we've been doing, we don't have any way to quantify the effect of the reactor, I said, thinking of the various demonstrations we'd been doing in the last few sessions. They were variations on the golf ball demonstration that Barry had done for me. We could see the results of the gravity wave, but we hadn't done a very good job of measuring the effect on an object placed in its path. I've got a pretty good idea of how to fabricate an instrument that will work. My first job out of college was with an electronics firm. I used to repair and refurbish pressure regulators. If they can measure minute pressure differentials, they should be able to measure the effects of the gravity wave. They'd also give us a sense of how the wave disperses. We'd have to build something fairly large to do that. What diameter would you estimate? Sixty inches? We'll have to get quite a few of those sensors, and then we can get started. I'll talk to Dennis. On the flight back to Las Vegas, I was thinking more about the conversation I had with Dennis than the one that Barry was going to have with him. I speculated about the presence of the men outside our house. I'd been fairly well convinced that they were part of the security firm who was investigating me so that I could receive the top-level clearance I needed. After hearing Dennis imply that I needed to be more concerned about my personal safety, I wondered if those guys had been assigned because of some imminent threat to Tracy or me. Worst-case scenario, what if those men hadn't been working for our side and instead were working against us? It seemed unlikely, but the whole what happened to the Russians and why had we been cooperating with our sworn enemy scenario was generating its own bit of paranoia. I wondered if there was some device that I could make to measure the influence of paranoia on me. Even without that device, I began to carry my forty-four Magnum and the Uzi in my car. We got the approval to build the device, and over the course of the next few weeks I worked at wiring the sensors in sequence. We had to use dozens and dozens of them. The work was tedious, but at least I could leave after each work session and see some progress. We also got some great news during that period of building the measurement instrument. The fuel triangles came back from LANL, and they worked just as the ones that we'd first been supplied with. Everyone was very pleased, and even Dennis showed some enthusiasm with a good work compliment. I hoped my involvement in the Los Alamos venture might offset a slight blunder that could have spoiled any chance I had of getting the job full-time. 
Before I began to carry my weapons with me, I decided that I'd better register them. The registration process was going to be easy, but I tripped up when I told a friend of mine that I could only spend a few minutes with him having lunch because I had an errand to do. "'What's that?' Jean asked, a perfectly normal conversational tactic. "'I have to register my guns,' I told him, and then added, regretting the slip of the tongue as soon as it was out of my mouth, "'I need to use them for work.' By this point in 1989, I had known Jean Huff for almost five years. He worked as a real estate appraiser, and taking photos was part and parcel of his job. We'd met because of my photo processing company, and since Jean worked very regularly and needed frequent photo service, we spoke on a number of occasions and eventually became friends. Actually, Jean dealt with Tracy originally when she was doing some of the drop-offs for me while I ran the equipment. She'd stop by his office, chat a bit, and they talked a few times about living in Los Alamos. Jean assumed that I worked in photo processing there, and it was only later when we became friends and we'd talked about a wide variety of things that he finally said to me, You know, you speak so knowledgeably about so many things, you've got your rocket car and everything else, you sound like a scientist and not just Bob the photo guy. Well, I am a scientist. I've studied and have degrees in electronics and physics. Why didn't you say anything? What? Was I supposed to hand you your photos and say, By the way, I'm a scientist? Yeah, that's what I would have done. Well, I'm not like that, I told him. Eventually, Jean and I grew closer, and we'd talk about a lot of things. But what my new work was, and why I might need a gun, was not on the list of topics to be discussed. To his credit, Jean saw how I had blanched when I made the mistake of mentioning the gun and work, and he didn't press me for details. Still, that I had let my guard down that way bothered me a lot. I trusted Jean. After all, he trusted me enough to sit at my kitchen table with me while I mixed up a batch of nitroglycerin and went off into the desert with me to witness its explosive force. Jean shared an interest in explosives and pyrotechnics, and two years earlier, in 1987, we had initiated a gathering in the desert of fellow enthusiasts for what eventually became known as Desert Blast. Through that and other shared interests, I also met John, the second son of the founder of the aircraft manufacturing firm Bill Lear, he of the Lear Jet fame. John was an accomplished pilot himself, and later gained some notoriety due to his claims about extraterrestrial life. John and Jean were both very interesting men, with active and inquiring minds, and the kind of curiosity that I possessed as well. I met John through Jean. Jean had watched a local TV show that George Knapp, a journalist at the local ABC television affiliate, was doing called On the Record. John Lear was George's guest. He was an active believer in what was termed ufology. He believed in the existence of alien life that extraterrestrial craft had come from other planets and solar systems. He appeared at panels on the subject, and he mentioned to me on several occasions that he believed that alien craft were being flown in the desert outside Las Vegas. Jean had some interest in the subject, as did a lot of people in the Las Vegas area, due to the frequent sightings and the light show out in the desert. He wasn't a proselytizer like John was, just, as I mentioned earlier, a really curious guy. John's views intrigued him, and he thought he'd call John up to talk more about the subject. That's just the kind of guy Jean was. When reached, John was a bit guarded at first. Well, a lot guarded probably characterizes it better. For whatever reason, Jean mentioned a couple of times that he worked as a real estate appraiser. The Lear family was wealthy and held several properties in the area. John lived in what I would eventually come to think of as a kind of compound, an enormous house and grounds. John seemed more interested in talking about having Jean come out to do an appraisal than he was in talking about UFOs. Jean thought it might be interesting to see the place where the pseudo-legendary, at this time, John Lear, lived. They made arrangements. In lieu of payment, John would share some copies of UFO videos and other material related to the subject. 
Gene called to ask me if I was interested in going. He said that I could pose as his assistant. Of course I'd heard of John and his exploits as a pilot, so I agreed to go. He sounded like an interesting guy, and I was curious to see how the other half, the wealthier half, of Las Vegas lived. As part of the appraisal process, Gene would have to take quite a few photos, so I became his second shooter and gear toter. After a brief introduction, Gene and I went about our business. Gene always claimed that because I was just the assistant, John ignored me. Gene dropped names a few times, mentioning that I had once worked at LANL. The Los Alamos reference didn't sink in until that third mention. When John realized belatedly that I wasn't just a photo guy, but had worked as a scientist, we started to talk about his experiences and mine. The two of us hit it off. We had some similar interests in aviation, propulsion, pyrotechnics, and other wide-ranging topics that caught our imaginations and intellects. This made us, if not kindred spirits, then at least individuals who could carry on a stimulating conversation with one another. I also knew this about John. He had some interesting connections in the government and the military. He'd done some work with the Central Intelligence Agency, and he could tell a great story. I never once for a second believed what he told me and others about alien spacecraft. I tolerated that part of him, mostly because the rest of his life and accomplishments were on the record, and at heart, he was a kind and fascinating guy. I also eventually came to understand this about John. He had no bullshit detector. He'd never seen any of these objects himself, and several times expressed to me his disappointment that he hadn't, and in my estimation, he indiscriminately took in what other people had to say on this subject. In that sense, he was what I would call a true believer. As I looked at it, if someone said it, John thought it must be so. He gave the same credibility to something that someone at the CIA had told him as someone he met in the street for the first time. That's not to say that John was gullible or not a highly intelligent guy. He was an expert in the field of aviation, and his ability to recall information and to even reproduce on paper a diagram of the hydraulics that powered the landing gear of an L-1011 aircraft, which I once asked him to do, was nothing short of remarkable. I took his belief in UFOs and aliens with a grain of salt. A lot of other people shared his belief, but that didn't make them bad people or uninteresting company. I also knew that Gene was eager to learn as much as he could about what I was doing out at Area 51, but he didn't press me for details. The afternoon of my little slip-up with him, Dennis showed up at my house and told me that I needed to go with him and that I had to bring my weapons with me. We wound up at a Las Vegas Police Department substation at the corner of St. Louis and Atlantic. After we got inside the building and passed the desk clerk, and after Dennis had shown the man there his identification card, he instructed me to sit down in the waiting area. I didn't have to wait there for very long. Dennis and a uniformed officer came out a few minutes later. The officer pointed at me and shook his head. This is the guy? Why would anybody, let alone the Russians, want to do anything to him? I tried not to take the remark personally, but I knew I looked like what I was a bespectacled scientist, and not a James Bond-esque spy or whatever else this cop had imagined. I also didn't like that he'd brought up the subject of the Russians again. Dennis didn't look very pleased that the guy had said something in public about the nature of our visit and the need for me to have those guns registered. That week, I wasn't called into work at all, and that troubled me a little. To offset that worry about how my security clearance was proceeding, Two men from the Office of Federal Investigation showed up at the house. Tracy and I had a couple of people over, her sister Kristen and another couple we had become friendly with, Wayne and Robin. Wayne was a mechanic and serviced our vehicles. We became friendly due to my interest in vehicles generally, and he was intrigued by the jet car that I used to take all around doing demonstrations. At this point, Tracy had indicated that she was no longer interested in running the photo-developing business. Wayne and his wife were looking for another business opportunity.
They were over for the day discussing the possibility of acquiring our photo operation. Before finalizing any arrangements, I thought it best to get them acquainted with the machines and how they worked. Wayne was obviously mechanically inclined and used to working with various processes and systems, but this was unfamiliar territory for them both. They also weren't familiar with the notion that some representatives of a federal agency could come to the house unannounced and begin looking around. On the one hand, I was glad to know that I was still being considered, but the intrusiveness of it all didn't sit well with me. I was in a bind. If I reacted too strongly, then I'd amplify Tracy's irritation. One of the agents was named Mike Thigpen, and though he tried to be courteous and professional, something about him rubbed me the wrong way. Maybe it was because Wayne and wife Robin were there. Because they were, I had to reveal for the second time that I was doing work which required such high-level clearance. Prior to that, neither Wayne nor his wife were aware of what I was doing, presuming that I was operating the photo business. Tracy knew about the need for security clearance, so I told her about the search. She wasn't pleased about the idea of the two men going through drawers, closets, cabinets, and nearly turning the place inside out. Unlike in TV shows or films where they leave the place a mess, these guys were very respectful. Despite my assurances, Tracy was still shaken by the length the men went to. I told her that we'd done the right thing by allowing that search, though I was not really happy about it all. I kept from her my relief that their presence let me know that the investigation was ongoing. There had to be some reason why I wasn't called out to work at S-4, but my being denied a security clearance wasn't the reason, at least not yet. Knowing that I was still in the running was far better than one of the other alternatives. I didn't want to press that point too much, nor voice to Tracy my concerns that this was an odd way to go about this business. The less said, the better. Let Tracy believe that this was standard operating procedure, and work to convince myself that this was true, and proceed with focusing on the job at hand. I can't say for certain why it was that a brief period of inactivity went on, but there were a couple of occasions where the reactor and the emitter weren't present in the lab. Other units working on other systems must have needed to use them. Of course, we were never informed of this, and it was mostly a surmise on my part and on Barry's part, but given what we eventually were allowed to do and to witness, that made the most sense. I don't know if it was because I was relieved to learn that I was still being actively investigated for the security clearance I needed, or if the home search indicated that I was under a new level of scrutiny, but I began to feel more comfortable talking with Dennis about our lack of real progress. Not only that, but Barry and I both began to let him know how much a hindrance it was for us to not be allowed to see and to inspect the other systems of the craft. We could study the reactor and the emitters in isolation, and we were getting closer to having a working instrument to measure the gravitational effects produced, but how that propulsion system functioned within the larger context of the craft was a gaping hole in our understanding. This isn't like a car engine of some unique design that's been dropped into a conventional automobile. We don't have a baseline knowledge of the drivetrain and the transmission and the steering and the suspension that are all common to most cars. I explained to Dennis in defending ourselves against his accusation that we weren't trying hard enough. How this entire craft functions, how this reactor and emitter work in sync with the rest of the components and systems is something we have no idea of. We're working with an unknowing inside of a larger unknown. That's not a great situation to be in, especially if others have knowns that they can share with us. My analogy seemed to work. Makes sense, Dennis said. I'll see what I can do. Barry and I took every opportunity after that to work at that tiny fissure in Dennis's armor. Every chance we got, we mentioned something about how seeing the entire craft was going to help speed the process. No one ever said that this was going to be easy, Dennis said to me one day. We're not asking you to make it easy, I told him. We're asking you to let them know that they don't have to make it so difficult.
Chapter 6 We've all heard the expression, Be careful what you wish for. I can't say for certain that thought passed through my mind during the extraordinary days and nights I spent on the grounds of the installation at Groom Lake. As is true of most experiences, when you are in the middle of one, deeply engrossed in the moment, you don't have a lot of time to consider anything but what is transpiring right then and right there. We've also all likely heard the importance of staying in the moment, staying present, and other variations on this idea. After having completed the last of the work on the pressure sensors, I arrived at Groom Lake a few days after speaking openly with Dennis. I went to the lab building as usual. What wasn't usual was that Dennis was there to greet me. At first, I didn't think much about him saying to me, You're not going to be working inside today. Instead of going inside, we walked to the hangar facility. Barry joined us. I could see immediately that one of the hangar doors was open. With the light coming from it, the scene resembled a jagged jack-o'-lantern's mouth. I understood immediately that what Barry and I had been asking for was about to happen. This was the night we were going to see the actual craft, or crafts, themselves. My initial reaction was to feel enormously relieved. If they were allowing me this opportunity, then that boded well for my future with the team. I also felt vindicated. Barry and I had succeeded in convincing the powers that be that the best approach was a more open approach. Just how open that approach was going to be was still to be determined, but at least they'd acknowledge the importance of our input. In a work environment like the one we were subjected to, even the faintest of nods towards your needs seems like a monumental gesture. I was also thrilled by the opportunity to see such amazing technology up close. Even if what we'd said, that seeing the craft and the reactor, amplifier, and emitters in the craft could help speed the reverse engineering process, didn't prove true, the privilege of seeing something that presumably only a handful of humans had seen was going to be something I'd never forget. Along with all those thoughts came another. How much access to the craft were we really going to get? The answer to that question came rather quickly. Once the vehicle came to a stop and we dismounted, Dennis said, Take a good look. I can't guarantee you'll get another opportunity like this one. I walked into the wedge of light coming out of the hangar and onto the concrete apron. I wanted to get the long view of the craft. The familiar saucer shape of the craft, like an inverted soup bowl resting atop a second one, sat on the paved floor of the hangar. It had no landing gear or other structure that might have supported its weight while on the ground. From what I could discern, it was approximately fifty feet or so in diameter and was roughly twenty feet tall. Where the two soup bowl discs met, the skin of the craft had a kind of rounded rim before the curves rose and fell to the narrower top and bottom. I moved closer and did a quick 360-degree turn around its perimeter, and where the two halves of the craft met, I could detect no seam. The same was true of the entire exterior of the vessel. I saw no panel lines, no welds, no rivets or other fasteners. As I had on first seeing the craft on that first day at S-4, I ran my hand along the surface. I looked over my shoulder, half expecting to be reprimanded for touching it, as I had been previously, but none of the security team members said anything to me. As before, the skin of the craft felt like a metal, cool to the touch, and very, very smooth. It was dark aluminum in color monochromatic across its entire surface, except for the four black rectangles near to the top of the upper dome-like portion. Later on I would speculate that they were sensor arrays of some kind, planner sensors that assisted in some type of celestial navigation, but at this stage I merely noted them and moved on. I was so engrossed in observing and noting as much as I could that I had nearly forgotten that Barry was also in the hangar with me. I entered the craft's interior through a small access hatch, just wide enough for me to put my shoulders through it with a fraction of an inch to spare. Once inside, I couldn't stand up straight.
Work lights had been installed at various points inside the craft. I maneuvered on all fours, hunched and using my hands to steady me, but not kneeling, along a honeycombed access way. Just as the exterior of the craft appeared to be seamless and was all rounded surfaces, so was the interior. It also appeared to be made of the same material of the skin of the craft. I was struck by the idea that it was almost as if the craft had been fabricated from melted wax and then cooled into this shape. Injection molding was the closest terrestrial machining or manufacturing process that I could compare it to. On that lowest level, I saw three seats, similarly looking as if they had been part of the molding process and not manufactured separately and then affixed somehow to the rest of the structure. They reminded me of a Scandinavian chair, without legs, looking very much like a rounded flower petal, more cupped than a tulip's, but nearly so. Just as the hangar had been lit so that we could see the craft's interior, so was the interior. The material only dimly reflected the lights, as if it had kind of a matte finish to it, but its color didn't appear to be layered on. Rather, it was integral to the material itself. Integral and integrated were the two words that kept springing to mind. Whoever had designed and built this craft seemed to have no concern for aesthetics, at least not human aesthetics. The three seats puzzled me. I saw no kinds of restraint systems, no indications of any life support systems, vents for example, and as I worked my way toward another access hatch, I was astounded by the fact that I saw not a single light, switch, dial, display, or anything that I associated with a vessel that traveled through space. All that interfered with the open design of this level, besides the seats, was a length of pipe coming down from the ceiling and exiting through the floor, presumably the parts of the propulsion system that carried the power or gravity wave from where it was generated to where it was emitted. I was in awe of the technology behind this elegantly simple and purposeful execution of a craft designed to travel enormous distances, and with what seemed to me to be based on the craft's construction, relative ease. It was on the second level that I saw the now very familiar elements of the propulsion system we'd had access to in the lab. The reactor sat on the floor, the waveguide piping ran from it to the amplifier and then additional tubing ran down through the floor to where, I imagined, though I couldn't see them, the emitters sat on the bottom of the craft. That platform section, or what is probably better described as a pedestal, was what the craft rested on. How, or by whom, the craft was piloted and navigated was something that I was hoping to be able to see for myself, but neither Barry nor I were allowed on to the third level where we presumed the pilot or pilots would have been positioned. I had hoped that I could have been able to sit inside what is traditionally termed the cockpit, but that wasn't going to be possible. Frequently, when I was faced with a design or some other kind of engineering or diagnosis and repair problem, I liked to sit with that problem. Often that meant walking away from the task at hand and just thinking about the issues or distracting myself with other work hoping that on some subconscious level I'd be able to come up with a solution. Other times sitting with it took on a more literal sense. I would sit near the device, or in the case of my jet cars and other vehicles, like the ones I converted to run on hydrogen, I sit in the problem and, fully immersed in that environment, experience a kind of osmotic absorption of the solution to the problem. As cramped as the interior of that craft was, I imagined that the life-forms who could move comfortably about in that space had to be about the size of a six- or seven-year-old human, I wanted to linger inside for as long as possible. That possible wasn't too long, since cramped conditions literally can produce cramps, but I did take a few extra moments to marvel at the intelligence behind this execution and implementation of the propulsion system within the larger context of the craft itself. I was blown away by what I'd seen. I'd been convinced, for a while, that what we were working with at S-4 was not of terrestrial origin. 
but seeing this entire craft really solidified what I'd come to believe. I knew with as high a degree of certainty that one can know anything that we didn't have the capability, the Russians didn't have the capability, the U.S. and the Russians working in concert didn't have the capability, all the world's greatest minds working together couldn't produce a working artifact like the one I was in. As I eased myself along to exit the craft, I kept shaking my head in wonder. My face had that half-flushed, half-swollen feeling of having smiled and laughed for too long. I briefly wished that I could share this experience with others. At the same time, my attitude had evolved in the time I'd been working at S-4. Initially, though I understood the government's and military's position about secrecy, I resented it. Now that I was literally and figuratively on the inside of the operation, a kind of elitism set in. I didn't think that many members of the American public could truly appreciate the magnitude of the achievement this craft represented purely on a technical, scientific, and production standpoint. I was completely blown away, and I'd already been privy to a lot of information about the craft and its origins. Whether this craft came from Zeta Reticuli or was a product of the drunken or febrile imaginings of the collective membership of the Theta Tau Engineering Fraternity, it represented such an enormous advance in moving a life form from place to place that I struggled to come up with an analogy that would make sense to explain what it meant and felt like to be in its presence. Once outside the craft, I disengaged the fawning fan mode in my brain and resumed scientific inquiry mode. I wondered about the craft's structural integrity, given that the skin of the craft seemed so thin. I wondered how heavy the vehicle was, but I couldn't really imagine myself putting my hands on it and trying to lift even a corner of that pedestal off the ground. I looked around the hangar and saw that a small crane stood in a far corner. I walked over to it and saw that its load limit listed on a safety sticker indicated a maximum capacity of two tons. That at least gave me a ballpark sense of the craft's mass. I thought of the fuel discs again and wondered for how many hours or light years they lasted and if the ship's interior was mostly used as a cargo hold for them. How long had the one we had been using in our lab been discharging? Barry and I stood again on the apron in front of the open hangar door, and I wondered if our mouths were hanging open. We didn't speak until we were back in the lab. "'Did you ever think you'd see anything like that?' Barry said. "'Did anything in your life before this prepare you for that?' "'I've been trying to come up with a way to explain what this whole scenario is like, how to make sense of it for myself.' The only thing I could come up with was this. Imagine that we were with the settlers on the Oregon Trail, riding along in our wagons back in the 1830s. We go to bed one night, and in the morning we see this machine that has two wheels, a seat, handlebars, and some device cradled in its frame and a chain going back to the rear wheel. We'd know it as a motorcycle today, but they'd only seen crude early bicycles. Given enough time, they'd probably be able to figure out how to get that motorcycle started and even to ride it a bit. They wouldn't understand how the engine worked, and even if they did, once the thing ran out of gas, it was probably only good to them as a plow they could drag behind draft animals. Barry nodded. Something like that. More to the point, I said, realizing that maybe Barry didn't feel the need for that kind of explanation. I didn't see any signs of crash damage. Listen, Barry said, I was never a believer in the whole Roswell incident. I don't follow those kinds of stories. It seems strange to me that an intelligence that is advanced enough to produce what we just saw wouldn't be able to negotiate the Earth's atmosphere or have a landing system figured out or not be able to cope with our weather systems and phenomenon. I agree. I said, just doesn't seem like a plausible explanation. Barry and I debriefed for a while longer, and we both postulated about how the propulsion system worked. 
we weren't any closer to figuring out how we could reproduce the devices to produce the kind of gravitational field we surmised was at work, but we had a better sense of how the reactor, the amplifier, and the emitters worked to produce a kind of anti-gravity effect that would allow it to render our usual concepts of space and distance immaterial. Without realizing it, we were on the verge of doing something that I had only presumed was possible, witnessing the craft in actual operation. The next time I was called in to report, I still kind of chuckled at the insistent regularity of the message, Hello, Mr. Lazar, it is now, insert time, we expect you to be at the installation at, insert time. Barry and I got busy working with the modified pressure sensor instruments we'd devised. We were about to use them to measure the intensity of the gravitational field when Dennis stepped into the lab. Follow me, he said. We went outside, and sitting in front of the open first hangar was the craft we'd recently examined. This time, and it struck me as odd, each of the interior doors connecting the individual bays was open. In addition to the craft that we'd been allowed to inspect, I could see eight more saucer shapes through the procession of openings. I wondered briefly if we were going to be allowed to see all of them. Each of them looked to be of similar shape, and it wasn't just because of the distance I was from each of them, but they appeared to be of slightly different size. The one we'd inspected was smaller and sleeker than the others, as if it was the sports car in the lineup. In fact, from that point onward, I always thought of and referred to the craft I was able to enter as the sport model. A low-performance test is going to be conducted. We thought the two of you should see this, Dennis said. I looked over at him, trying to see if he was pleased by his having made arrangements for this, but his face was impassive. I remembered the look of irritation on his face when I'd remarked that the military was still doing things then the way that they had nearly fifty years earlier out at Los Alamos and in Chicago and in other locations trying to create the atomic bomb. All that compartmentalization and secrecy had slowed progress. If they wanted us to be effective, they needed to let us share information. That was how most advances in science and technology despite the belief in the romantic notion of the lone wolf working in isolation model, were made. Here we were getting some access, greater access to information than before, but still in a far more limited manner than I would have preferred. I knew it was time to keep my mouth shut and just observe, and that's what I did. What frustrated me was that with the exception of Dennis, Barry, and I, there were few other S-4 personnel around. The omnipresent security guys were there on the periphery, but there was one technician sitting there with a pair of headphones on while seated in front of what must have been a radio, and one other man who stood at a distance from us and kept his back to us the entire time. I stood there with my arms folded, rocking back slightly on my heels, and then the craft did something similar. At first, I heard rather than saw any activity coming from the craft. A loud hiss, nothing painful but the kind of buzzing sound that an electric substation might produce, reached my ears. Then, the craft lifted off the ground slightly, wobbling, the central axis tilting a few degrees from vertical. As it lifted off, I could see the blue glow of a corona discharge coming from the bottom of the craft. That led me to believe that the air around the bottom of the craft, where we suspected the emitter was, was being broken down and photons were being emitted. The light was visible, just as lightning in the sky is, due to that incredible high-energy output. As the craft rose, the slight oscillations lessened and the hiss diminished. By the time it was thirty to forty feet in the air, lifting nearly perfectly straight up, the sound was completely gone. In all my years of working with jet engines and pyrotechnics, I was accustomed to hearing loud noises as objects were being propelled upward or forward. The silence was eerily exciting, and I felt a broad grin spreading across my face. I could hear the faint sound of an appreciative expulsion of air coming from Barry as I stood there wide-eyed and mind-boggled. I could see 
that the craft had three emitters. Only one was creating the corona display, and it was the one that was facing straight down at the ground. As the craft rose in the air, the display expanded. It began as a tight beam and became more diffused with each foot the craft rose. It was like watching someone twisting the lens of a flashlight, increasing the size of the circle of the light from its narrowest to its widest focal range. As that gravitational wave spread out, it helped to stabilize the craft. It hung there, completely still, as if it were suspended there by an invisible steel rod firmly anchored to the ground and some point above it. With it hanging there above us, we could see more clearly the bottom of the craft and its triad of emitters. They were arranged in a pattern, with the one that was functioning at the point of the equilateral triangle. The other two emitters pointed at a right angle to the downward pointing one. Given this orientation, because we were looking up at the larger spherical shape of the craft, I decided to think of the area to the left of the downward pointing emitter as the rear and the area in front of the two other emitters as the front or forward section. That was because the opening of the two forward emitters pointed in that direction, and from what we believed of how the gravitational wave was produced, the energy coming out of the open end of the emitter would allow the craft to move in the same direction as the opening. I knew this was a low-performance test, but still, I was hoping to see the craft maneuver in the air. It didn't. I looked over at the technician with the radio. He was far enough away that I couldn't hear him speaking into a headset, but I could see that he was talking, presumably to whoever was piloting the craft. I thought again of the cramped space inside and the childlike proportions. I also wondered how in hell a radio wave, an electromagnetic wave, would be able to work in the presence of that gravitational wave. No kind of phase-locked loop should have been able to survive in that environment. The electronics guy in me engaged in a brief battle with the physicist in me over which phenomenal phenomenon to focus my attention on. I didn't have long to contemplate them. After a few minutes of hovering in place, the craft descended and settled, reversing the process of moving from a stable orientation to a wobbling one before coming to rest. That's it, Dennis said, always the master of understatement. Time for you guys to get back to work. Barry and I did as instructed, both of us lost in thought for the next fifteen or so minutes. We each sat on a stool in front of the lab bench. Barry scrawled a few lines in a notebook while I fiddled with a micrometer, measuring the thickness of the lead points of a few pencils and comparing them to the lead rods I used in a mechanical pencil. It didn't seem odd for us to be so quiet. While engaged in work, we both tended to go inward. We'd both witnessed something on the order of a miracle, if one accepted the definition that a miracle was the result of an agency from outside our terrestrial realm, and we both needed time to process what we'd seen. I suppose in some Hollywood version of these incidents, the two of us would have charged into the lab flush with excitement and gone to the blackboard and started furiously writing and erasing parts of a complex equation we'd left there while exclaiming loudly, I've got it! I can't believe I didn't see this before! The truth was that since we'd started working, we had a sense of what was going on with the reactor, amplifier, and emitter. The flight demonstration simply confirmed that our theory was, for the most part, correct. We hadn't seen the craft move laterally, nor had it covered a great distance in a short amount of time, but the fact that the device created a focused beam, for lack of a better term, of highly concentrated energy and a gravitational field, that it could also disperse more widely, would allow it to cover vast distances. I had suspected that the gravitational field was doing something that scientists and science fiction writers had been speculating about for many years. It was producing a kind of negative gravity, or anti-gravity, that, in a sense, removed the gravitational force ahead of the direction in which the three emitters were pointing. In time, Barry and I came up with the name Omicron to describe the action of the single downward emitter functioning to lift the craft above the ground.
that Omicron action allowed it to initially escape the gravitational pull of the very large body it was near, the Earth. When all three emitters worked, the same anti-gravitational force was produced, allowing the craft to move in multiple directions. This omnidirectional state of operation we termed Delta. We chose Omicron, the fifteenth letter of the Greek alphabet, because it means small. In the Omicron state, the craft and the propulsion system configured in this single emitter operation could only make relatively small moves. Delta, the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet, has its symbol used in science to indicate change, and we believed that when the three emitters were arranged in a kind of delta shape as they were, it allowed the craft to essentially move freely and change direction with stupendous rapidity that made our current capability pale in comparison. How the emitters worked was still in question, but orienting them in various directions was similar to how our spacecraft worked. It wasn't so much that the system defied our understanding of the laws of physics, its ability to move as quickly and as efficiently as it did was astounding. Essentially, when the propulsion system created that gravity wave or anti-gravity state, everything we knew about how objects could orient themselves in space, about the nature of flight, was altered. It was easy to get hung up on language and whether a gravity wave was being produced or if it was anti-gravity. But essentially, on a fundamental level, what the makers of this craft had done was create a device that could achieve something astounding, gravity control. It reduced or canceled the gravitational field. No one on Earth had been able to do that to that point. It had been speculated about and hypothesized about but it had not been achieved as we sat there in 1989. Words fail me now, as they did then, to explain how great a paradigm shift in thinking was necessary to truly appreciate what we'd just witnessed. That said, as had been true for most of my adult life, I was able to come up with an analogy to explain in layman's terms how this process worked, or at least to create a visual metaphor to illustrate it. Imagine placing a bowling ball on a level mattress. It would sink into the cushion for a bit before settling and becoming still. If left undisturbed, the bowling ball would not move. You could push that bowling ball and get it to roll. In a sense, man's early efforts at flight were like that. We used a propeller to push air behind the plane to get it moving, used the angle of the wings and their surface area to create lift, and the airplane would leave the ground. With a jet engine or a rocket, we expel hot gases out of the rear of the engine to push the plane forward and create lift. What this alien craft did was like placing your hand on the mattress in any direction around the bowling ball and compressing the cushioned material. The ball would roll in the direction of where the resistance had been removed. A somewhat crude analogy, but sufficient to understand the basics. What the emitters were able to do was to remove the force of gravity, not just in a tight beam enabling it to move forward, but widening the beam, and having the emitters pivot in various directions was akin to having a group of people standing around that mattress, each of them pressing down on the cushion at various points, allowing the ball to move in multiple directions. Imagine those individuals moving with great speed and force, superhuman speed and force, and the visual becomes even better. I didn't share this analogy with Barry. He showed little interest in my previous motorcycle dropped in among the settlers scenario. What was far less difficult to imagine was how this craft was able to cover vast distances. In a sense, it didn't cover any ground, as we so frequently describe an object moving from one point to another by going over ground from point A to point B. Instead, Using that gravity control, this craft pulled distance objects toward it. Imagine a ball resting on a towel with a frisbee at the opposite end of the towel. With the emitters in the frisbee doing their thing, the fabric of the towel was pulled toward the ball that was anchored to it. It was as if the universe was being folded in an accordion-like fashion. As I noted when I first saw the propulsion system functioning, time and gravity 
are inextricably linked. If you controlled gravity, you also controlled time. That solved the dilemma we currently have with long-distance space travel. How could you possibly supply humans with enough oxygen and food, but even more so, how could you expect them to outlive our usual lifespan in order to travel to distant galaxies? What this propulsion system did was render moot all those kinds of questions. Normally, Barry would quickly shut down any kind of speculative questions about the origins of the device we were working on. He was far more disciplined in his thinking and with his emotions than I was. Following that demonstration, though, even Barry's mind was spinning. You know, I'm not sure if what they told us is true, but after seeing this, it opens up a whole universe of other possible explanations. I mean, I was sitting here thinking that this thing could have come from another dimension. It could have come from some point in the future. We just don't know. The whole Zeta Reticuli story could be a cover-up. I just don't think we've got the advanced technology to produce this ourselves in this time. Not even with the assistance of the Russians or teams of scientists from everywhere. I agree, but you know, Barry, like you always say, if we keep thinking about that part of it, we'll go crazy. Barry laughed. You're right. Kind of fun to think about, but we aren't here to have fun. Frustratingly, as Barry and I talked about this gravity control device, we kept coming back to the same question over and over again. How was it able to produce such an enormous amount of power from such a simple system without the production of any kind of heat and sound and other indicators of the prodigious amount of energy being used to overcome what we on Earth consider to be one of, if not the most fundamental forces in the universe, gravity? How could something seemingly so simple and fueled by such a simple and small object as the disks do that kind of work. In a way, I wondered if perhaps it functioned on the principles of some martial arts, using your opponent's energy against them, in opposition to them. Ultimately, as our discussion wound down, and the frustration of feeling as if we'd returned to square one and were no closer than ever to being able to reverse-engineer the system, it felt pointless to construct ways in which to describe what was going on. I'd heard it said that language allows us to master and take control of our world, to give it shape and meaning. All I could think of as the hours went by and the lights above us hummed nearly as loudly as the craft had was that a mechanical pencil produced a point far less sharp than a pencil sharpened mechanically. At that point, I wondered if maybe I was losing my sanity as more and more divergent and unproductive thoughts passed through my mind. After all, Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I was more than a little relieved to go home that night. I was tenacious when faced with a problem that needed to be solved, but now I was frustrated and intrigued and the push-pull of those two competing forces would ultimately be won by another force, one that was far beyond my control. Chapter 7 Added into the mix of all the questions I had regarding my situation came another and more frustrating question. Why was it that after granting me access to the craft and allowing me to view a test flight, did the voice of the EG&G representative suddenly fall silent? I'd experienced one fallow period in my time with EG&G and been rewarded with those two opportunities. Maybe, I tried to console myself as week one of no calls turned into week two, I'd be similarly rewarded again. What form that reward might take occupied some of my time when I wasn't working, but not nearly enough. Tracy seemed very occupied with the business, her flying lessons, and her social life. She sensed that something was not right in my world, but when she asked me what was wrong, I told her that I was fine, that nothing was in any way out of sorts with me. The devil's bargain that I signed in agreeing to a confidentiality clause required that I not divulge anything, good or bad, 
a potential state secret, or a simmering dissatisfaction with a co-worker, the quality of the food in the cafeteria, the frustrations with having to respond on a moment's notice, the havoc the irregular schedule played with my sleep, were all equally off-limits. I'd put up with the unannounced visits to my home, agreed to have my privacy violated by allowing our phones to be tapped, and wasn't even raising a fuss about the fact that I'd yet to receive a paycheck. All I wanted to do was work and to contribute to solving this problem, and I was being subjected to what I thought was a kind of tantalizing treatment. They'd teased me with privileged glimpses, then back away again. Also, for as much as I'd witnessed and believed, and now believed to a greater degree the truth of what I'd read in the briefings and later seen with my own eyes, there was still the possibility that I was somehow being set for a fall. What the nature of that fall was and why I'd been chosen wasn't clear, but I wasn't willing to dismiss anything as a possibility. After all, if my mind had been blown away and my perceptions opened by what I'd seen and learned while working at S-4, then I would be foolish to believe that only the most righteous and above-board and honest dealings with the employees at S-4 were being conducted. Put another way, when your belief system in one part of your life is rocked, that aliens existed in theory but not in actual fact, and now knowing that visitors from outer space had been on our planet, that seismic upset reverberates in other parts of your life as well. Maybe if I had someone with whom I could share what I'd experienced, another perspective to help me sort through all of this upheaval, then maybe I could have found a better way to respond to what happened to me as the Ides of March passed and I grew more and more anxious and uncertain about my future. Even now, many, many years after those events in the early part of 1989, do I still wonder many of the things I wondered back then. Hindsight generally affords us an opportunity to see things with greater clarity. Growing older and having more experiences can make us wiser, but I still have trouble establishing a firm footing about whether or not the path I chose to take was reckless, wrong-headed, self-sabotaging, or right. Perhaps it was all of those in some combination. As a scientist, I was trained to look for and to find truths. But we all know that even in the scientific community and the undertakings made under that umbrella, there is much that appears initially to be black and white and absolute, but later is revealed to be more gray than white or black. I write this as a way to preface what was to prove to be the unraveling of my life. I paid a heavy price, as did others, and I take full responsibility for my actions and regret deeply those who suffered collateral damage as a result of them. I won't go into much detail about the civilians who were affected. To do so would only open old wounds and expose people I care about to additional discomfort. In some ways, I wish that I had taken this notion of collateral damage into fuller account during those weeks in March of 1989 when I grew increasingly impatient and resorted to self-preservation as one of the central movers in my decision-making. Generally, I'm not a very paranoid individual. I never had a reason to be. But after learning what I had and seeing those demonstrations and crawling around inside that craft, and then not being called in for a week or so, just at the time when we seemed to be making progress and I was being given very exclusive access, I started to really wonder what the hell was going on. After all this transpired, someone told me that the writer William S. Burroughs once wrote, Sometimes paranoia is just having all the facts. I wasn't aware of that quote back in 1989, but I had some thoughts along that line. To contribute to my growing uneasiness, the house continued to be under surveillance. I did the best I could to ignore it, and I definitely didn't look at it as the positive sign I once had. I suppose that back when Mike Thigpen interrupted the meeting I was having with Wayne and his wife, when our deal for the photo business was still pending, I probably was engaged in a form of wishful thinking. Their search of the premises was very odd, mostly because as far as I knew, and Tracy had pointed this out, 
no one that we knew ever commented on the fact that they had been contacted by any agency. Not anyone in my family, no friends, no former employers or colleagues. No one let me know that they'd been questioned about me. That was very odd. A few days after witnessing the low-performance test, I was at home getting ready to go out on a delivery run. I stood at the kitchen sink, rinsing my coffee cup, and saw either a Buick Skyhawk or a Chevy Nova sitting across the street from our house. Whatever the make and model, it was one of those nondescript, bland kinds of cars that I seldom saw in our neighborhood. Inside the car sat two men in dark suits. They were looking straight ahead. I didn't see them using binoculars or a camera with a long telephoto lens, but I was pretty sure they were there watching our house. That suspicion was confirmed when I exited the house and then drove off to drop photos by at Jean's office. The car pulled out behind me, and unlike in thrillers or police procedurals, they made no effort to disguise the fact that they were following me. They didn't keep more than a car length or two behind me, accelerated to keep my pace, and went through a yellow light I purposely slowed down for and then sped through. When I got to Jean's office, the car parked a few spaces away. I was thrown off balance by it all, but managed to pull myself together and didn't let on to Jean that anything out of the ordinary was going on. Jean and I transacted our business, and I went on with the rest of my day. I had to make a stop at Home Depot to get some supplies for a repair project on a leaky shower head, and the mystery car was there again, trailing behind me. Like the car, the two men were bland and relatively nondescript. Caucasian, mid to late thirties or early forties, dark suits, white shirts, and sunglasses doing battle with the morning's low sun. I almost had to laugh when I thought of recounting that description to anyone, like I was some hard-boiled detective in a noir detective film. It wasn't so funny when they followed me home and then remained there until another car and two men came to relieve them early in the evening. When they were still there in the morning, I decided to call the police. I recounted to them what I presented earlier, including the terse description. The officer who took the information assured me that she would pass it along and to expect someone to come to investigate the situation at some point. It must have been a slow morning in Las Vegas. No more than a half hour later, a squad car approached the vehicle and then parked behind it. A minute or so later, the officer got out of the car and approached the driver's side of the vehicle that had been sitting there. I wasn't able to hear or see much at all, but within minutes, the officer was back in his car and drove off. My watchers remained. While all this was going on, Tracy had come downstairs and was getting ready to leave for work. "'What's so interesting out there?' she asked. "'Not sure. The police just pulled someone over briefly. Gone now.' "'Are you turning into one of those kinds of guys?' she said, teasing. "'What do you mean?' Her eyes revealed her amusement. "'Oh, you know, the stay-off-my-lawn kind of cranky guy who watches over everything in the neighborhood?' Not wanting to reveal my concern, I played along. "'No, not one of those guys. The kind of guy who buys a police scanner and monitors all the activity going on around the city. Your guy is way too low-tech for me." She narrowed her gaze at me, unsure, it seemed, if I was kidding or not. "'I'm surprised you haven't figured out how to make one, or maybe that's just one of your projects.' She used her fingers to make air quotes around the last word. "'An idle mind,' I said, reminding her of the famous Ben Franklin quote. Tracy left a few minutes later, and my mind was not idling at all, but racing. What had gone on between the police and the observers? Why hadn't they come to speak with me? I'd given my name and address and phone number to the person on the phone. Was I going to get some kind of response to my complaint? Was I going to be followed the rest of the day, and for how far into the future? What did all of this have to do with what I most recently witnessed at S-4, if anything? I decided it was best to just go about my business. I could see how easy it would be to get too worked up about it all, 
I had planned to meet a friend named Mario at a local gym. He and I were workout partners. Every other evening, usually Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, we met and did some cardio work or some weightlifting. Maybe a workout would help relieve some of the stress and help me put things in a better perspective. I pulled into the parking lot a few minutes after six o'clock and waited. I thought about the previous time Mario and I had met there. We exercised and then left. I had walked over to my Datsun 280Z and, while chatting with Mario, pulled out my car keys and went to unlock the door. I inserted it, but noticed that the door was already unlocked. That's weird, I said. Yeah, it is, but in Japan... I cut Mario's explanation of sushi off. He'd been telling me about the new restaurant he'd just gone to. No, my car. The doors are unlocked. I never do that. No, you don't. That's your baby. You treat her right. At the time, I attributed it to just being tired. That night Mario was running a bit late. I got out of the car after Mario had walked up to mine. I got out, locked the doors, and then lifted the handle. They're locked, right? Far as I can tell, Mario said. We both wanted to be home a bit early, so we cut the workout short. About forty-five minutes later, we walked out of the gym. I took a few steps into the parking lot and then stopped in my tracks. I looked across the way, and there was my car with both its doors wide open, looking like a fixed-wing aircraft. Holy shit, Mario said. What in the hell you got broken into? I stood there frozen in place, my mind ratcheting through several possibilities. It could have been a car burglary. The Z had a decent stereo in it. I had left my wallet and the Uzi I was carrying around for protection inside it. It seemed strange to me that a thief would leave the doors open. Why leave a hey look what I've done calling card? Had they been interrupted in the middle of the job? None of that made sense. I'd confided in Mario about my work situation, and I think that though it took him a bit longer than it did me for it to sink in, he got it. I don't know if we should walk over there. Who knows? He let the thought drift on the night wind. The car did have central locking, but a malfunction of that system wouldn't have allowed the doors to open and the hatch to rise. Somebody had to open those doors, and I had a strong suspicion the men who had been following me were sending a message. We're still here. I can't say that my blood ran cold or a shiver ran down my spine, but I did experience that gut-level twinge and burn of adrenaline kicking in. I had to fight the urge to jump in the car and take off after them let them know what it was like to be pursued and followed. I knew it wasn't a good idea to inflame the situation. Look at what happened when I called the police. Mario and I both jumped a bit when the doors behind us opened and rattled. A couple of other gym members walked past us. I guess I need to go over there, I said. Yeah, you do. We walked over to the car, and I kept telling myself that I had nothing to worry about. I was definitely spooked, and I could tell that Mario was as well. If you don't mind, I said, I'd like your help. With what? We're going to have to start the car. That's your job. I'm going inside. We both laughed. They'd sent a clear message, a sign of the kind of power and control they held over me. They didn't like being messed with. I didn't like being messed with either. I decided the best course of action was to try to de-escalate the situation. I needed to get better control of my state of mind as well. After all, I had no confirmation yet that I was no longer going to be working at S4 or anything like that. I had Dennis's phone number, so I decided the right course of action was to go to the source and not let my mind run away with me. After all, I also told myself, nothing had gone missing from the car. I got someone in Dennis's office and explained that I wanted to speak with him. After being told that wasn't possible at the moment and getting a vague to no response at all to my follow-up questions about when he might be available, I left a message indicating who I was 
and that I very much would like to speak with him at his earliest possible convenience. On and off for the next few days, I noticed that the car would be outside our home, but the following stopped, and nothing bizarre happened while I was out and working on the last few of the photo jobs I was taking on. When forty-eight hours passed, and I didn't hear back from Dennis or anyone at the number he'd given me, I made another inquiry and left another message. When the tailing resumed and my calls still went unanswered, I started to worry even more, and not just about whether or not I would continue to work for E.G. and G. at S-4, but about my own safety and Tracy's and other people I knew. I didn't believe then, and don't believe now, that my fears were the product of an irrational response to stress. Was I stressed? Certainly. Greatly. Undeniably. Was it plausible to believe that because of what I knew and what I had seen that some harm could come to me? Yes. Definitely. For as much as I tried to focus just on the task at hand, the implications of what I'd experienced and knew had tremendous consequences. They wouldn't have been going to the length they were to do background checks on me, and they wouldn't have required me to consent to my phones being tapped, and they wouldn't have asked me to sign a document that essentially stated that I agreed to waive every one of my constitutional rights, which I did sign, if there wasn't a serious need for them to keep this information in-house by whatever means necessary. That may seem like a large leap in logic, but given all that I've described about the need for me to carry a weapon, the heightened drama with the surveillance teams, I figured that I had to do something to protect my best interests. No one else was going to do that, so it was incumbent on me to think ahead and consider wisely what I should do to protect my professional reputation, my chances of getting gainful employment elsewhere, and the physical safety of me and others. Only later, after I made the decision to share what I knew with a select few friends, and later more widely, did I think more about the public's right to know this kind of information. I never set out to be a crusader, and though some called me a whistleblower, I blew the whistle initially almost exclusively as an act of self-preservation, whistling to call attention to me to make it less likely that harm would come to me if I made clear what I knew than it was to draw attention to the program at S-4 and reveal the nation's deepest and darkest secrets. All of those thoughts got generated in my head, were amplified, and were only emitted when I felt pressed into a corner and had to do so. I knew that Gene was the first person that I should tell. He was my closest friend at the time, and he was about as level-headed a person that I knew. I felt that he'd believe me, and because he didn't have as much at stake personally as Tracy did, he'd be better equipped to give me some guidance about how I should proceed. I had a few vague thoughts in mind. I was confident that everyone who knew me would believe me, but still thinking about the possibility that I might wind up somewhere in the Nevada desert with a bullet in my head and a fabricated suicide note left at home, I was leaning towards showing them evidence to prove the existence of those craft. Sitting in Jean's car as we drove along Alta Avenue was both comfortably familiar and surreal. I prefaced my story with the kind of disclaimer you might expect. This is going to sound really strange, but... When I was done, Jean said that coming from anyone else but me, he'd be incredibly suspicious. Then he added, I knew that something was up when you told me about the gun registration and mentioned something about work. I couldn't have imagined that it was something like this. But hell, who knows what kinds of things go on out there? I figured the UFO stuff was just a bunch of wahoos with nothing better to do with their time. I didn't mention to Gene anything that I'd read in the briefings. For this first time speaking with someone openly about what I was doing, I wanted to stick to what I could definitively validate. What I'd seen, what I'd done, what had been done to me. As tempting as it was to go beyond those three categories of events, I refrained from doing so. As I pointed out before, Jean was an immensely curious man with wide interests, and his curiosity was reflected in the half-dazed, half-enthralled look that spread his face. "'Just so you're aware, Bob, I'm going to do a little digging around on the subject. 
not to undermine you or anything, just because you've got me thinking. Jean, you're a free man in a free country, and I would never think of telling you what to do or how to go about it. Thanks for listening to me. No worries. Tracy know? I haven't told her yet. Obviously, I want to keep as tight of control of all this as I can. At this point, I don't see the sense of pissing anybody off. You think you might have already? I can't imagine how. Like I said, they let me on the craft. They let me see it low fly. And now nothing and some harassment. This is all just so nonsensical. Jean nodded. Hard to figure. Sometimes an irrational response is the only one you can make to another irrational act. But I don't think that's wise here. Agreed. I'm sure I'll need to talk to you about this again. I hope not, but even if I did get called back in, I'm not sure how I'd respond. That's understandable. I just don't know if it's all worth it. I produced from my pocket an envelope that contained the first and what would prove to be the only check I ever received. I slid it over to Jean. $958.11, he said. That's what the United States Department of Naval Intelligence pays a senior physicist? That's right. You do it for the love of it, and not to get rich. And to be honest, Gene, this isn't so much about the money as it is the headaches. If I'm getting this kind of runaround and treated like this, the dollars to headache ratio is way out of balance. Gene and I talked for a few more minutes, and then he dropped me off at home. When Tracy got back from work, I inadvertently used the words that anyone in a relationship shouldn't use as a point of entry. We need to talk. By the time I made it clear what the subject was, all the tension left her body. She sat on the couch, drew her legs up, and heaved a big sigh while looking at the ceiling. This isn't some kind of goof, is it? You're serious. I can always tell when you're trying to get me. No goof. No getting you. Holy shit, she said, drawing out the holy for a few seconds. This is nuts. Essentially, yes. I can't see you making up something like this. She drew a strand of her hair to her mouth and chewed on it, a habit she had when she was nervous. I hadn't told her everything about me being followed and the incident at the gym parking lot, hoping to spare her some worry. Later on, I'd come back to this moment and see it in a different light. Of the three people I spoke to about my concerns, John Lear was the most receptive. That made sense, given what he believed to be true about UFOs back at that time. I'd later come to learn more about the extent and the extremity of John's controversial views, but in those first few minutes he, like Jean, seemed more curious than alarmed. Look he said, rubbing the stubble on his chin and neck. We all know that something's out there. In the desert? John winked at me and said, looking from side to side as he did so, Yeah, in the desert. He raised his eyes toward the ceiling, indicating that it wasn't really just the desert he was talking about. I looked around John's home office. The bookshelves were lined with various volumes of different types and sizes. In the corner, a telescope rested on its tripod and leaned against the wall. Along one wall were a series of framed certificates and awards John had received for his exploits as a pilot, among them some commemorated world records he had set. John was an accomplished pilot. More than an accomplished pilot, actually, he was fearless and also a bit reckless. Of course, once I got to know John, he shared with me the story of how he injured his feet and legs to such a degree that at times he hobbled around his home in Las Vegas. His father had created and manufactured updated version of a Lear jet. Over time, the model designation has escaped my memory. John was assigned a simple task. Do a flight demonstration for some clients considering acquiring the jet for their use. What John heard and what he listened to were very different things. 
Instead of an easy, conventional demonstration of a takeoff and landing and flight, John asked himself, since this was the latest and most improved version of the jet, and highly capable, why not show just how capable it was? He decided to do an outside loop, a very, very challenging and risky acrobatic maneuver. As John told me, once you committed to the move, you couldn't back out. Well, John committed, didn't back out, even when he knew that he was in trouble, and plowed the jet into the ground, sustaining multiple leg injuries, among others. John wasn't someone who was going to play by the rules, but I did trust him. In fact, I trusted him enough to take trips with him when he had to ferry commercial jets to one airport or another. He asked me along both for company and to wear a suit so that I could pass as an FAA inspector. Once aloft, John would light up his pipe, later to doze off completely with the autopilot of the L-1011 functioning, and then wake up just in time to land the craft manually. I also trusted him with Tracy's life, and he gave her the first few flying lessons she had. He even allowed her at one point to take the controls of a commercial flight he was piloting. To say John was a loose cannon is an understatement, and in looking back on it now, I can see to what degree how stressed and anxious I was to believe that John was someone who could help me put events into their proper perspective. By that I mean how I should approach the situation vis-a-vis -vis my employment prospects. In terms of having someone who could assess the capabilities of the craft and determine whether they were anything in line with what terrestrial technology could produce, I knew of no one more qualified than he was. There was some risk inherent in sharing this information with John, but I also knew how much he believed in the existence of alien spacecraft and beings. My focus remained purely on the technology, and if John could offer any insight into that, then it was worth the price of having him possibly go off on tangents regarding the beings who produced that craft. I'd be able to tune that out. That's not to say that he wasn't an interesting guy to be around, and he demonstrated his generosity toward me on multiple occasions. Still, John had his own theories about extraterrestrial life and government conspiracies that I can see now, in hindsight, predisposed him to believe what I was telling him. I also want to make it explicitly clear that he never urged me to do anything. He simply accepted an invitation to participate in acts that I instigated. I was grateful that, for a few days at least, things seemed to settle down. No strange incidents occurred, and though the guys on overwatch were still around the house, I wasn't being followed, at least as far as I could tell. I supposed that, in retrospect, I inadvisably let my guard down a bit. One afternoon, two days after letting Gene in on my secret, we were at his house. Over lunch, he told me that he'd been searching the Internet for information about UFOs. This was still early in the life of the Internet, and information was relatively scarce compared to how it has proliferated. He told me a number of things, none of which really jibed with what I had witnessed, and even back then we realized that you can't believe much of what you read on the Internet. We continued chatting, and I asked him about the source of the information he shared with me. There's two places in particular that seem to be gathering points. One is called MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. The other is QFON, the Canadian UFO Network. That's not very Canadian of them, I said. You'd think the kindly Canadians would want to be part of the Mutual Network. We got to laughing and joking a bit more, and it felt great to breathe easy for a bit. Eventually, Gene decided that since I had the real deal in terms of UFO information, I should be referred to as Bufon for the Bob UFO Network. I countered with him transforming himself into Goofon, for obvious reasons. For the rest of the time we spent that afternoon, we continued to call each other by our new noms de UFO. Gene's wife had given birth to a son on March 15th, and Jean was giddy with delight and sleeplessness. It was good to be around someone who was in such good spirits. He was grateful for the break from the routines of a young one and visitors. Somehow, all of this made me think that maybe my world had somehow been righted. That feeling didn't last. 
I woke up before sunrise to see that the car was stationed in the same place it had been before. I wasn't physically tailed, but it was exhausting to feel as if my every move was being watched over. When I got home later in the day, Tracy was out. I felt like I needed to commiserate with someone. Deciding to not let on how down I was, I called Jean. When the answering machine responded, I said, Goofon, this is Buffon. I have the baby pictures for you. I know you need them as soon as possible. Jean hadn't given me any photos, and I hoped that he'd pick up on that right away. I sat there hoping he'd call back. In the interim, about forty-five minutes later, a car came into our driveway and braked hard. I heard a couple of car doors slam and then a rapid knock at the door. I answered it, and two very official and distressed-looking men in suits escorted me to the kitchen table. There they began their interrogation. Basically, they wanted to know who this Buffon character was or what it was code for. The same with Goofon. Then they produced a printed copy of the message that I'd left for Jean not quite an hour earlier. I couldn't believe how quickly they'd gotten it and then gotten to the house. I was tempted to ask them about how they managed that task, but I could see they were in no mood for light-heartedness. I told them that they were just goofy names we'd made up a few weeks ago. We were in a silly mood at the time, and that was it. Nothing sinister at all. That seemed to appease them, but they produced a document that they made me fill out. I had to identify Gene by name, provide them with his mailing address, phone number, and other information that I was sure they already had. I also had to refer to Gene by his last name, Huff, and then add Gene Huff, a.k.a. Goofon. To this day, and even back then, Gene and I still laugh about that incident. Gene will still, on occasion, sign his name and then append it with a.k.a. Goofon. Even though I was amused by that incident, I still felt like lines had been crossed. I'd agreed to the wiretap, but that was to determine my suitability for a security clearance. It no longer seemed certain to me that they would conclude that I was a good candidate to work at S-4, so I thought the investigations should cease. I'd also essentially signed away my rights to due process under the law. I'd been trying not to think of that while all of this nonsense was going on, and had never mentioned that fact to Tracy. When I had told Gene about that, he said, I'm not surprised you signed that document, but I sure would be worked up about it. You don't respond to things like that the way the rest of us do. Hearing him say that made me realize even more that I needed to bring this thing to some kind of conclusion. If I wasn't able to keep my wits about me in the way that Jean had indicated I had in the past, it was time to make some changes. In the initial interviews, I'd been asked a lot of questions about how I managed stress, and I'm sure that my phone calls to Dennis's office, I'd made a few more with no success, calling the police, and now playing name games, all contributed to my sense that my days at S-4 were over. I can see now that I did those things for another reason. I wanted the wait to end. I just wanted to be told yes or no and move on. I knew that security clearances could take time, but it was the frustrating stop and start of the work, being pressured to figure out the answer, but not being given the proper time needed to solve it, that made me get to the point that I wanted something definitive to be said or done. It may be hard to believe, but coexistent with those feelings was a desire to see the job through. I can't say it was as strong as it had been before, but by still wanting to do the work, and not being able to do the work for no reason anyone could really offer, ratcheted up my anger at being put in that situation. I decided to take action. As I pointed out, I wanted my wife and friends to have eyewitness certainty about the claims that I had made. That meant one thing, getting them out to the area to see a test flight. For years people in the area had reported strange lights and other activity in the sky. Because of my time in the lab at S-4, I knew when one of those displays was going to occur. Wednesdays at 8 in the evening was the usual time a high-performance test flight was going to be conducted. I informed the rest of the others that I thought we should all drive out to the desert to witness one of those tests. John Lear owned a Winnebago motorhome. 
and he volunteered to drive us all out to the perimeter of the base. In some ways, I thought that maybe including John wasn't the best idea. There was also some odd tension between Jean and him, but I knew that John's expertise and his eight-inch diameter Celestron telescope would be valuable in assessing what we saw during the high-performance test. As a bonus, we could travel in style in his motorhome. It was a 150-mile or so trip through some of the most boring desert landscape you can imagine. We'd be setting out in the late afternoon and getting there after dark when there'd be even less to see. Of the assembled group, Jean and John performed as the two ends of the poles between skepticism and belief. Jean wasn't rabidly anti-UFO belief, but given some of the strangeness between the pair, I figured they'd give each other crap. That would be good for some entertainment. We always seemed to be able to ride John pretty hard when he launched into some out-there discussion about whatever had caught his attention. John was kind of like a magpie. Anything shiny, and he'd take it and fly off with it. Yet, when you asked him a question about his area of expertise, it was like a switch flipped in his brain, and he was the most articulate and focused expert. Sure enough, after John picked up Tracy and me, Tracy liked John since he was the one who really introduced her to the new love of her life, flying, we headed to Jean's house. When Jean came out to the motorhome, I heard John snort. "'Where the hell did you get that shirt?' he asked. I hadn't paid much attention to what Jean was wearing, but at John's cutting remark, I saw that it was black and purple and looked like massive bruising had spread across my friend's upper body. "'Your wife got it for me,' Jean snapped back. It wasn't exactly a your mama joke, but close enough. John put the RV in gear, and we headed out from Jean's place. The usual conversations about best routes began. Jean was in favor of taking the interstate until we got to Highway 93 to head north. John had to be contrarian, so after making a few veiled references to President Eisenhower and his real reason for establishing the interstate system in this country, instead of the interstate, he took Powerline Road, until it intersected with the Great Basin Highway. "'How can you be in the middle of nowhere if you're nowhere?' Jean asked as we bounced along the irregular pavement. "'That's for greater minds than yours to determine,' John said. "'I know this, though. I've flown over a few different nowheres.' and I can tell you that the middle looks a lot like the rest of it. Tracy intervened and asked about Jean's new baby and how he managed to get the night off. His in-laws were still in town, and they looked at him askance when he told them he was going out with friends. I heard someone say once that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission, John chimed in. We all laughed at that. The conversation was on anything and everything but what we were all about to do and to see. I suspected that the worst thing that could possibly happen was the test flight to be cancelled for some reason. The weather wouldn't be an issue, but I knew that there was nothing I could do to control what the powers that be decided. At one point, the RV began to stagger a bit on a climb. "'Damn it!' John said, and pulled over to the shoulder. Eventually the problem was diagnosed. The transmission was low on fluid. "'Call yourself a pilot? Have you ever heard of a pre-flight check?' "'And to think I let you take my wife up in a plane!' More good-natured insults and comments were hurled at John. Jean volunteered to hitchhike back to a gas station to get some fluid and then hitch a ride back. When he came back, he had a six-pack of beer in one hand and two quarts of automatic transmission fluid in the other. "'This!' Jean said, hefting the beer. Goes in us. He then lifted the other containers. These go in the transmission. Got it, John? Mind if I use that shirt to wipe off the dipstick, dipstick? John looked very pleased with his comeback. Took you nearly a hundred miles to think of that one, didn't it? Jean offered, never one to allow himself to be topped. Because of our delay... I was glad that we'd allowed enough time to make it to Groom Lake before night fell. The tests were generally conducted shortly after the sun went down. As we bounced along Groom Lake Road, a washboard dirt road at the far end of the site and outside the installation's boundaries, 
I had to laugh when John turned off the headlights. This is exactly the right vehicle for a stealth operation, isn't it? John nodded. Thirty-five feet of bone and machinery rattling stealth at your service, guaranteed to alert any one of your presence within a mile and a half. Let's just hope we don't have to make a fast getaway, Gene added. I wasn't sure if he was truly concerned, but I reminded him, and more especially Tracy, we're on a public road, on public land. No one can tell us that we can't be here. Besides, with John with us, all we have to do is drop his name and his mom's, and all will be forgiven. Tracy looked at me, and I watched a shadow of worry pass across her face before she smiled and squeezed my hand. Along with some food and beverages, we'd also unpacked John's Celestron telescope, a couple of pairs of binoculars, and a video camera and tripod. We went about the business of setting up the devices. Once the equipment was set up, we stood, shifting nervously from foot to foot, and waited. We didn't have to wait very long. Within minutes after settling in, John, who was looking through the telescope, shouted, I got something! He pointed into the night sky to our north and east toward Area 51 and S-4. A light had suddenly appeared above the Papoose Mountains. A bright light, at the orange end of the spectrum, began to glow brightly. I stood focusing my attention on the bright object as it appeared approximately forty-five degrees above the horizon. A few instants later, it appeared at sixty degrees above the horizon. Then, seemingly in the time it took for me to blink again, it had climbed again and was then thirty degrees to the right of where I had just been focusing. I heard a commotion behind and a few muttered swear words and exclamations of surprise and delight. I kept my eyes on the lights. Once again, the light moved in what I could only describe as a staircase maneuver, appearing at one height and the up, over, up, and over. That's no winged aircraft, John said, his voice firm with conviction. I recognized his authoritative tone mixed with a bit of awe. No way in hell anything we produce could make those kinds of maneuvers. Flat out impossible. Did you see that? Gene said, nearly shouting. Zipping along like that and then just stopping? How in the heck can it do that? After I'd seen the low-performance flight, I was certain that the gravity control theory we'd arrived at was correct. Seeing this high-performance flight only confirmed it. It's nearly impossible to convey in words how quickly the light moved from one location to another. I'd seen jets flying overhead in the night sky, and I could easily scan their path of travel with my eyes while my head remained still. Not so with this. Even from that great a distance from the light source, at times the craft's maneuvers had the light moving out of our fixed line of sight. It was astounding and thrilling to see how that reactor and its other components actually worked in a real-time application. I had an even greater admiration for the engineering behind the emitters. How could they move so quickly to accommodate the kind of movements the craft was making? How could objects as large as they were, and made from a material that was somewhere between a metal and a ceramic, move so quickly to allow them to point in the direction that the craft was moving in? They appeared to be rigid structures, yet they moved with the fluidity and flexibility of a muscle. Were they, when under power, somehow transformed into a more supple, more elastic material? I also wondered about the color of the discharge surrounding the craft. Why did it appear to be orange? Not pumpkin orange, but duller, with more brown mixed in. When I'd seen the low-performance test, the corona discharge had been a bluish purple. Now, with the thing in flight, and presumably expending more energy, it was producing a discharge at the longer end of the wavelength spectrum. Orange wasn't in the spectra of atomic hydrogen that would produce bright reds like in the aurora. If oxygen molecules were excited, you'd see purples or blues from nitrogen being ionized. Just another piece of the puzzle. I thought of sodium vapor lights, the kind that cast an orange glow and are frequently used to light city streets. Was it possible that the craft was some sort of sodium alloy? Sodium is very light. It floats on water, 
and the parts we'd been working with were incredibly light. But sodium is also terribly reactive with moisture. Perhaps it overcame that characteristic somehow. Maybe this was a big anode, a positively charged electrode by which electrons leave a device. I wished that I had brought the compact spectrograph I owned. It would have shown the Fraunhofer lines in the light and therefore identify which elements were present. Because we weren't in line of the direction the emitters were pointing, we couldn't see what form the distortion was taking, how it might have affected our visual sense of the area around the emitters specifically and the craft generally. If we had been standing right beneath it, right there at S4, we would have been able to see that, and I could compare it to what I'd witnessed during the low-performance test. Eventually, the light descended below the peaks, and the test was over. We all stood silently for a minute. The sky filled with stars, and the night air felt chilled again. Crickets chirped, and the wind rustled a creosote bush, and I smelled its fragrance. The whole time the test flight had been going on, I'd been aware of very little going on around me, all of my other sensory apparatus shifting power to my eyes. I heard a voice, as if I was coming up from being submerged in water. I gradually made a sense of those sounds. Here we are, at a super-secret government installation in the desert outside of Las Vegas near Groom Lake. What we've witnessed rising over the Papoose Mountains confirms what many have long suspected and the government has long denied. The voice was John's. He stood in front of the video camera that he'd mounted on the tripod, and he was sounding very much like a news reporter doing one of those live-from-scene broadcasts. The camera's light cast him in a bluish glow, and just outside that light I could see Gene standing, still scanning the sky, his eyes ablaze and his smile a wide gash across his face. Amazing, Gene said. Amazing! He lightly tapped the side of his temple with the flat of his hand and kept his head wobbling for a few seconds. John was still narrating his story and Jean came up to me with his hand out. "'Thank you. Thanks for this, Bob. I can't tell you what this means to me, that you shared this.' I was glad to have done it, and told Jean just that. Then he went on. "'I know that maybe John won't say this. You know how we can sometimes be. I think I know why you invited him, too. Guys spend a lot of time believing in this stuff, catching hell for it sometimes.' You let him see what he's believed in and wanted to see. That's a nice thing you did. I had considered John's situation before, but Gene made me understand things on a deeper level. I could empathize with John. I knew some things, and if events hadn't unfolded like they had, I might not have ever been able to share what I knew with anyone else. Little did I know just how far the parallels between John's plight and mine would extend. I joined John and Jean in loading up the gear. Tracy was still standing in place, arms wrapped around herself, staring up at the sky. "'You think it helped?' Jean asked me. "'What do you mean?' He nodded toward Tracy. "'Had to be a little weird for the two of you, leaving the house on short notice all the time, things like that. Seeing is believing.' Maybe on some subconscious level I had wanted to prove to Tracy that my absences from home were for the reasons I'd told her. This might have made me a bad husband, but at the time I really didn't have much of a sense that my work at S4 had put much of a strain on our relationship. I believed she understood what was necessary and believed her when she told me that she trusted me. Still, it seemed odd to me then, and remains so until today, that Tracy hadn't said a whole lot while watching the demonstration or after. She'd expressed some concern when I first told her of the plan and what it might mean for me and for us if I violated the security agreements I'd entered into. At least, after the high-performance test, she could better appreciate what was at risk. We had a long drive ahead of us, and we all were early risers, so we quickly got back into the RV for the drive home. I think that we'd all gotten a jolt of adrenaline through our systems, and were paying the price for it afterwards 
with lethargy. A few days later, I let Jean know that I was planning to go out to the site again. This time, I had invited another friend along. John couldn't make it. I was a little more concerned that time about being watched and tailed, so Jean and I worked out a plan to use a rental car to drive out there. We debated about meeting points and drop-off locations, working ourselves up into a bit of a state for what proved to be no good reason. Still, better to be safe than sorry. There was a kind of Three Stooges quality to our planning, as if we mixed up the two CIAs, the Culinary Institute of America and the Central Intelligence Agency. Tracy was going to join us again, and maybe it was the overlay of fear that clung to her that had Jean and me in a bit of a tizzy. Some of that was due to the one discussion that the participants in the first trip did have on the way home. My reluctance to write about it is a reflection of what they discussed and my long-standing lack of any real focus on this issue. Jean had remarked that the entire time the flight was going on, I seemed lost in my own little world. That was true. I was fascinated to see the craft in flight, and was trying to visualize how the systems I saw were capable of producing that kind of performance. John reminded me of a remark that he had made at the time, while the craft was still in the air, and that I didn't even remember him making. You were still just standing there with your tunnel vision goggles on, and I said, at minimum, that thing's got to be going seven hundred miles an hour. Then it's stopping on a dime. Then it's back up to seven hundred miles an hour again. Can you imagine what that kind of lateral acceleration and deceleration would do to the being inside it? You're right. I don't remember you saying that. And you're right, essentially... That would be the equivalent of hitting a wall at 700 miles an hour. I don't know for sure if the human exoskeleton could sustain that kind of velocity, of having the organs sloshing around. I don't know if they'd come out, but they'd certainly be crushed. John raised his finger in the air. Precisely what I was trying to get you to conclude. A human body couldn't survive that speed. I'm not talking about the human body keeping its guts intact. I'm talking about there not being a human body in there at all. Some other being had to be piloting that thing, no doubt. Jean said, I don't know about that for sure, but it did get me thinking. I know that you said, Bob, that there were nine other of that kind of craft out in the hangar. I was just sitting there wondering what those beings' lives were like. Did some of them work at the factory or whatever that produced them? Did they go home to mate at the end of the day and be joined by their kids who went to school? I considered that for a minute. I have to confess to you guys. To me, that's the least interesting part of this. I didn't consider any of that at all while watching the test. The machine was the thing for me from the beginning, and it still is. I don't know if I believe what I read in those briefings. I admit, I didn't read them all. But still... What fascinates me the most is the technology. The rest... I let the words drift along the highway to scatter with the wind. In the days after witnessing that first high-performance flight test, I'd been taken up with other ideas than the life of the beings that created those craft and how the craft arrived here. In some ways, that was immaterial. As I've said many times, the allure for me was the immensity of the power that propulsion system produced. What stymied me was the realization that it produced that power in a nearly reactionless fashion. As near as we could determine, apparently no nuclear reaction was going on. We could detect no change in the identity or characteristics of an atomic nucleus that resulted from it being bombarded with an energetic particle and there were no fission or fusion products left over from a reaction. As near as we could determine, no chemical reaction was taking place. We detected no rearrangement of the molecular or ionic structure of a substance that produced a new one with a different chemical identity. No combustion. No decomposition. No synthesis. We determined that the propulsion system bent light and distorted gravity. But that meant that we were dealing with rougher concepts than the kinds of reactions I just mentioned. Most people could understand decomposition. They'd either seen it or smelled it, 
but when you were talking about the disruption of gravity, you couldn't visualize or smell a rotting piece of meat. Instead, you had to play around with more abstract concepts like time and distance. For most of us, those are firm parts of our reality. I look at a clock and see what time it is. I don't think about how that clock is, in a sense, an artificial construct. We as humans created the concept of time as existing in blocks of 24 hours. It's a good construct, but it is still artificial. The same with space and distance. I drove 12 miles to get from my house to my job. But how we broke up that distance into miles is completely arbitrary. That's why there's a metric system and an English system that give you different totals. Same distance, but different numbers entirely. We've all agreed to use these systems of measurements, but in trying to explain how this craft moved, how it bent gravity, you'd also have to understand that our usual, everyday conceptions of time and space and distance weren't going to serve us very well. John and Jean had joked about the need for greater minds to solve the question of where is the middle of nowhere. The same was true of coming up with an explanation that really and truly and accurately described how those craft, and that one craft in particular, moved from one location to the next. While I spent the next week working, I anticipated that my fellow spies were going to look to me to help them grasp an explanation for what they saw. For the 29th of March, 1989, the mean temperature was 70 degrees with a low of 57 and a high of 80. Those facts were noted and recorded. We set out to note and record what we believed would be evidence of the craft's capabilities and existence. Tracy and I took separate cars, Jean picked up the rental car, and we all met at the rendezvous point. Jean and I took more circuitous routes than necessary. Our fourth, a man I'll refer to as Jason, met us along the way just off of Interstate 15. We proceeded as before and set up our viewing area. As happened the first time, the light from the craft glowed in the distance, did its staircase maneuver, and then others. I heard Jean ask, Did you see that move it just did? It went vroom, boom! No, I didn't, I said. I had just set up the video camera, capturing Jean's words and my response. A few seconds later, Jean said, Look at how light it's getting! Jason had joined me at the camera, and I was still working on the focus. We exchanged a few words about whether or not we were getting anything on the view screen. Finally, satisfied that the camera was capturing the increasingly bright light, I stepped away and watched with a naked eye. The craft hovered for a bit. I blinked, and it had moved closer, the light increasing in intensity. The pattern repeated itself. I think it's coming at us, Jean said. It is, isn't it? Jason said. That's pretty cool. By the time they were finished saying those things, the light had grown much larger and much, much closer. We all scrambled behind the trunk of the car, crouching and looking skyward. Jean looked at me, startled. What are you doing? You're never scared. You sit at home making nitro like it's pesto. I had to think about it for a second. I wasn't really frightened. I told him, I'm a human being. Instincts kick in. Bright glowing object in the sky moving my way fast? I go for cover. That's reassuring, Jean said. I wasn't sure if he meant that I was human and had natural reactions or something else. I didn't think any more about it. As the power output increases, the intensity of the light increases, I told them all. The light wasn't eye-searing, but it was somewhat painful to look at. We were able to speak in a normal conversational volume since the craft produced no discernible sound. It was still well above our position. It was like I couldn't see it move, Jason said. One second it was there, the next second it was over there. Almost like a strobe effect or something. Looks like it'd be a fun ride, Jean said. Just be sure to keep your sphincter closed tight. Only you would say that, Gene.
I told him. And then, cutting him off before he could ask, No, I don't know if they have sphincters. Well, all I can say, Jason added as he laughed, mine is quivering right now. You weren't completely off track about the strobe effect. As the propulsion system produces more power, that glow is brighter. The gravitational effect also disturbs light, time, and space, I told Jason. Breathtaking, he said. Stunning. My face feels frozen from having been smiling for so long. By this time, the lights had darted back over the mountain, still above them, before the sky above S-4 went dark. "'Worth the drive out here?' Gene asked Jason. "'Hell yes,' he said. "'I've seen it twice now, and this time was even better with the kind of flyover, or at least fly-at-us view that we got.' Gene paused. "'I don't know, Bob. Is it right to use the word fly? I mean, people call them flying saucers, but how that thing moves doesn't really compare.' I guess that fly is the right word if you think about something being above the ground and moving. How can it possibly do what it did? Jason asked. We all stood in a tight semicircle, collapsing tripods and folding chairs. I'd been thinking about this moment for a while, how I might be able to provide a visual for everyone to understand as best I could, or at least provide a visual for the concept. I took a five-dollar bill out of my wallet and held it up for everyone like a magician about to do a trick. So imagine that this bill is the universe. If I take a pen and put a mark here at the far edge of the bill, that represents a starting point. When we traditionally think of time and space and travel, that dot would move incrementally across the bill from one edge to the other or in some other path. For the sake of argument, let's just say it is going to move directly across in a straight line. To do that, to make you be able to see that, I'd have to take my pen and, in essence, make a whole series of dots from one edge to the other. In other words, I'd draw a line across the bill. That's how we experience movement as a series of moves, one after the other, across a surface. Got it, someone said. Well, with this craft's propulsion system capable of gravitational change, it's like it folds the bill in a series of moves, bringing that far corner, where my line eventually ended, closer and closer to it, until it was across the span of distance. Only it did it far faster than you or I could make the moves to fold that bill. I see. That makes sense, Gene said. Jason nodded. Tracy nodded as well. The thing is, we can all understand that on a certain level, I mean, that's a rudimentary explanation of it. Astrophysicists and others might have more technical and more elegant, even, ways to explain what I just did. But the most important thing about all of this is that here on Earth, we can conceptualize this, but we can't, or at least to this point haven't been able to produce a machine capable of doing what that craft does. We simply haven't not by a long shot. And that's what I was being asked to help do. And what if we could do what that thing did? Gene asked. We'd be masters of the universe. I hoped that we'd use it for good, but we could create unbelievably powerful weapons of mass destruction as well. We could become destroyers of worlds. It boggles my mind to think of what it would mean to be able to generate that kind of power over gravity. Anti-gravity? Jason asked. I suppose you could call it that, but what's the opposite of gravity? What does that mean? I see your point, he said, and then added, stating the thought for me, at some point language just kind of falls short of all this, doesn't it? Speaking of falling, Gene said, I'm about to collapse. Let's get home. As was true after the first test flight we all saw, we didn't speak much about what we'd seen on the drive home or in the days after. Part of that was because of the secretive nature of our visits, but mostly it was due to the simple fact that we all had lives and jobs and families to go back to.
It was kind of funny to think of it in terms of the capabilities that craft had over space and time, but the world didn't stop turning because of what we'd witnessed. We just had to keep on moving forward. To that end, I tried again to contact Dennis and never got through, never got a return call to my messages. Strange to think that I was part of what seemed to be some unraveling of one of the great mysteries of the world, but I couldn't get a guy to return a simple phone call. I suppose that's what I deserved for choosing to do government work. No force of nature, terrestrial or extraterrestrial, could compete with that kind of stubbornness. Chapter 8 Some say that the third time's the charm. In this case, that was true, but in our case, the charm was used to break the spell that had me enthralled to the work I'd been doing at Area 51's S-4 site. In the intervening weeks since I'd been last called in to observe the test flights, I'd added to my list of frustrations the nature of how the work I was doing there was being conducted. It had troubled me from the beginning. In science, you should be able to take a linear approach to problem-solving. You set up an experiment or your thinking with a clear beginning, middle, and end. You do as much reading as you can, familiarize yourself with the work that others have done, etc. We all learned about the scientific method in school, and it's a good model that has stood the test of time. But at S-4, and working for whomever it was that I was really working for in the military and government, I'd been placed in a situation where the linear was out the window where the scientific method didn't consist of a series of defined steps, but was more scattershot. In a way, our approach to the problem of reverse engineering the propulsion system was like what a diagram of that high-performance test flight and the craft's appearance would have looked like. First here, then there, then up, then down. I'd really had it with every aspect of the job, if I could properly refer to it as a job. And wouldn't you know it, just when I'd reached that point, they'd reached out to me and called me again to let me know that I should report the next day to work again at S-4. I'd been so used to the regularity of the woman on the phone's patter, the it is now X time and you need to report at Y time, and that Y time being just an hour or two from X time, that the next day really threw me for a loop. Maybe it was an act of passive aggressiveness on my part but I simply said, thanks, and hung up the phone with no intent whatsoever of going in as instructed. No one had bothered to respond to my messages, not even to say, we can't tell you anything now, but we will be in touch when we have more information for you. Instead, they answered with silence. I was going to respond similarly, but with absence. I also wondered why the next day had they observed us somehow? The car outside the house and the following was irregular at that point, but then again, maybe they'd changed up their tactics. Who knew? If they had followed us, I thought, so what? We were on public land, violating no laws. Of course, I was violating all of the agreements I'd signed, but desperate times called for desperate measures. On April 2nd, another Wednesday, and the day of the call to report back, Jean, Tracy, Jason, and Tracy's sister Kristen joined me on another trip up to Groom Lake. You might think that the novelty had worn off by then, but it hadn't. When the craft flew towards us that second time, and we'd all ducked behind the car, a new dimension had been added. Who knew what other elements to the high-performance test might be added? What additional information could I glean from witnessing the craft in operation? At that point, obviously, I didn't care about how that knowledge might help me help them, but I wanted to know for myself the answer to the question of how the systems functioned. We took more precautions on the trip out there. We made frequent stops and diverted from the highway a couple of times and looped around the interchange to see if anyone was following. That bit of trickery added to the excitement. We talked about a number of things, the subject getting serious only once, when Jean mentioned that the oil spill near Valdez, Alaska was spreading, and residents there on the Gulf of Alaska were up in arms. For my part, 
I was more interested in an item that appeared revealing that scientists at Brigham Young University had fused heavy forms of hydrogen into helium at room temperature. They hoped that the process, piezoelectric fusion, in which a heavy form of hydrogen is electrically infused into titanium or palladium, might lead to a viable power source someday. They believed that they were still a long way off from it being a viable source of energy, but given what had happened with the oil spill, more and more concerns about greenhouse gases being expressed, I was at least hopeful. Obviously, I also thought of it in terms of the propulsion system I'd been working on, how it gave off no real heat during its reactionless operation. I saw Tracy roll her eyes a bit as she looked at her sister. They both nodded and said, Okay, Dad. I laughed, grateful that their scientist father had instilled in them a tolerance for that kind of talk. Eventually, the sisters' conversation turned to who might want to join them to see the Tom Hanks film, The Burbs. I knew that they were teasing us, but the point was clear. Lighten up. They were both highly intelligent women, but this was an outing, an adventure, and not part of a seminar. To avoid detection and vary our pattern, we drove down an even more isolated road off of Groom Lake, deeper into the desert on a track that the ranchers used to ferry their cattle. We were careful to still be on a public road and still have a good vantage point from which to view the test flight. Our growing anticipation had us all nearly giddy. We joked around with one another, and it was good to leave behind the burden of my decision to end my relationship with Dennis and the rest of the people who had anything to do with S-4. We returned to the theme of our ill-preparedness to be spies and to carry out our approach in a manner that even approached stealth. And you were the one who gave John so much crap the first time about not having enough transmission fluid? I said to Jean. Yeah, but he's a pilot, he said again defensively, knowing what was coming next. But to not have enough gas in the car to even get us onto the interstate? Jason added, referring to part of our plan to stop shortly after meeting up to see if we were being tailed. All part of the plan. That quick pit stop was designed to suss out the situation. What's a suss? Don't you mean assess? Or maybe that you're an ass, Jason said, eliciting an appreciative laugh from the rest of us for his wordplay. By this time, we had rolled to a stop and were setting up our viewing area. Suddenly, we heard a soft thud and then saw a greenish round light rolling in front of us. A moment later, we all stood there with a deer-in-the-headlights look on our faces as a car parked no more than twenty feet from our position switched on its high beams. I was at the rear of our formation, mostly hidden. I ducked down, knowing that of all of us gathered there, I was the one who was in the most vulnerable position if we were to be detained. "'What are you folks doing out here?' I heard someone say. "'Who's asking?' Jean said. Installation security, a different voice replied. You are on military property. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. If you don't comply, there's Nevada State Troopers in the area that I'll radio. At that point, I decided it was best for me to get out of there. I'd asked Jean a while ago to keep my gun in his car. I eased the door open. We'd switched off the dome light ahead of time to avoid detection and eased the gun out of the glove box. Using the cover of everyone else's voices telling the security personnel that we were on public roads and not violating any statutes, I hid out in the bush away from the car. After a brief protest, our group said that they would do as asked and leave. I watched as the security detail, the two men, got back in their car and waited. Gene got everyone in his car and within a few seconds they took off slowly in the opposite direction of the security vehicle. I waited for a bit until the security car began to move away. Once their tail lights began to dim, I scrambled along in the underbrush and soon caught up with Jean and the rest of them and got inside the vehicle. We all bemoaned our fate and grumbled about not being able to see the test flight. 
but we also all tacitly understood the precarious position I was in, and to a lesser extent the jeopardy I'd placed them in. We were still rolling along slowly. We crested an incline, and Jean muttered, Oh, shit! Ahead of us, a pair of headlights stared at us. A few seconds later, its police lights flashed. This might be funny, except it isn't, Jason said. Like being back in high school and being hassled for trying to find a place to drink. A uniformed officer stood in the middle of the road with a flashlight in one hand. As we neared him, he raised the other palm up. We stopped. Where are you going? he asked. I knew something was up when he didn't ask to see license and registration immediately. Just saw some lights in the sky from the interstate and came out here to get a better look, Gene said. We understood this to be public property. No signs for trespassing or anything like that. The officer trained the flashlight all around the inside of the car. Shut up your ignition. Stay right here. We did as instructed, speculating about what the cop was going to do. We saw him speaking into his radio's microphone. After a brief conversation, he returned to the driver's side of Gene's car. There's five of you in this vehicle. Yes, that's right. I got a report from the security guys that they saw four people in a vehicle matching this description. You got an explanation for that? Jason spoke up from the back seat. Well, it's dark. Those guys were just security men, you know. They came up on us, and one of them dropped their night vision light. Not exactly the most competent guys in the world. All of us in the car laughed at that insinuation. The police officer didn't. I'm sure they can count. Four when they stopped you, five now. I'd like to see some identification from all of you. All five of you, please. Each of us handed our driver's license to Jean, who collected them and handed them over. The policeman looked at each one. Then he rifled through the deck, then walked around the car and used the flashlight to illuminate our faces to make sure that our faces matched the photos. I had gotten into the driver's side seat and returned the gun to the glove box. I wasn't concerned about having it. I'd registered it and was legally allowed to transport it in a vehicle. I was concerned about what we had in the trunk. It was nothing illegal. John's telescope, the spectroscope I'd finally remembered to bring along, a Geiger counter, and a few other scientific instruments. Any one of those items would destroy our story about just happening by and seeing lights. Of course, the police officer asked if he could search the car. This was just after he asked us all to exit the vehicle. We complied with that request, but not with the search. Well, he said, I have to tell you, this doesn't look good for you, and won't if you have to appear in court. What that tells me is that you've got something to hide. Kristen spoke up. Officer, you said that this was a voluntary search. Our not granting you that access isn't evidence of probable cause. I'm fairly conversant with the statutes that apply here, so unless you can explain to us why it is that you've decided that this is no longer a case of us— the officer held up his hand. Then I'm going to my car, and I'm going to call a wrecker and have you towed out of here. Kristen took a few steps forward. No, you're not calling a wrecker. You can detain us for up to an hour, but that's it. You are not searching the car, and you are not getting us towed. You have no probable cause. If you insist on doing what you say you're going to do, then you're going to have a lot of explaining to do to a judge, to your superiors and I don't think you're going to like what they have to say. The officer walked away. Tracy smiled animatedly, the first real genuine expression of pleasure I'd seen in a while. Way to go, sis. Those law classes of yours are paying off. I may never become a paralegal, but at least I can sound like I know what I'm talking about when dealing with these guys. I can't believe he thought he'd scare us into letting him search us like that. Thanks, Kristen, I said. We could have stood there all night just saying no to him, I said. In an odd way, being out in the desert, watching the police car's Mars lights illuminate the landscape, 
felt so much stranger to me than if we'd all been watching an alien spacecraft flying around. I'd been bored and unsatisfied with working as a photo processor. Life certainly wasn't boring any more, but I wondered then if it was worth all this stress. There had to be some middle ground. I remembered my mother using the term happy medium when I was a kid and telling her that maybe an unhappy large was more what I was going to be on the lookout for in my life. Seeing the faces of everyone gathered around me heartened me. None of them were pointing fingers at me and blaming me for possibly getting them into trouble or for wasting their time. They knew what I'd put at risk in sharing the information I had with them. They were all doing their best to protect me. Despite the obvious potential complications, it felt good to be there with a group who were all working together. After about five minutes spent in his cruiser, the police officer approached us. Checking to be sure he was returning the right licenses to the right individuals, he handed back everyone's identification but mine. He held on to the last one, looked at me, and then said with a tone that I had difficulty deciphering something between sarcasm and admiration, I guess they know who you are down there. He nodded toward the base. He handed me my license, stepped back, and said, You're all free to go. Drive safe and have a good night. We all breathed a sigh of relief and got back into the car. On the ride back, we didn't talk much at all. Jean asked the question that was on my mind, and I assumed on everyone else's. What's next? We'll see, I said. I'm beyond trying to figure out what's going to happen next. For a few minutes, we tried to come up with a plausible explanation for our presence out there. It soon became clear that it was pointless to even try. It was so obvious what was going on that it was a waste of time and mental energy to go through an excuse-making exercise. A lot of thoughts passed through my mind as we headed toward Las Vegas, but I never considered that one of the group I trusted had broken that unspoken bond and said something that might have drawn the security guard's attention.